All right, everybody, we're ready. Sorry about that. Just kind of catching up here, getting our bearings straight. Ben, how you feeling today? Feeling really good. Oh, today. Now, if you could, please recite with, uh, for the listeners that uh, wonderful song you were singing today. Uh, I got a woman to stage drunk all the time. Yes. Ding, 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 ding. That song? Yeah. Uh, do you, for You know the name of the group for 10 trivia points? <laughs> Let's up. Bad up, boy. Look at the brain on Brad. Acting like we didn't talk about it for like a half hour. Well, you may have you forgotten. <laughs> I got a woman stay drunk all the time. Yeah, there you all go. Right, rock and roll at its best. All right. Well, what's your favorite Led Zeppelin song? That, that one. All, that, really? Out of all of them, that's your favorite yeah, one? Yeah, man. What's your favorite? I don't know. There's so many good ones. Black Dog's pretty good. I like Black Dog. But I love that song. I just heard it on the radio coming in. I was like, ding, 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 ding. You know how it is with me, D. I hear a song once, it connects, and that's it all day. People come up to me and go, hey, Ben, how's it going? I go, I got a woman to stay drunk all the time. <laughs> so G your wife loves that. G <laughs> G G G G G <laughs> no, she's mad at me because I called you boy, okay? <laughs> it's affectionate term, man. All right, we're ready now. Okay, here we go. Your Ben Jarofsky Show for Thursday, October 10th is just moments away. But before we get into this, we need to thank the following unions for jumping on board and sponsoring our program. First up, it's the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150, and the Chicago Federation of Labor. Oh, forgot one other union, the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace, not Aerosmith Workers, Local 126 and District 8. Thank you to those unions. The Ben Jarofsky Show starts now. Oh, my. That did not sound well. Mm. We're just going to do a... Uh, let me try one. Try thing. again, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah, this is what this is for before wow. we start the show. Yeah. Sure. Sounded wonky, huh? All right, let's try it again. Hey, there we go. There we go. <laughs> it is Thursday, October 10th. And live from the Chicago Sun-Times, Chicago Reader Studio on Racine Avenue, this is the Ben Jarofsky Show. Today on the program, we welcome back In These Times writer Miles Camp Lassen, former Governor Pat Quinn will join us, and... Property tax talk with property tax guru, the one, the only, Andrea Rayla. And now your host. Oh, he loves this song. Chicago Reader columnist Ben Jarofsky. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Ben Jarofsky here. We're calling this All Alone Naturally Thursday. All Alone and what? Naturally is a song. Okay. All Alone Naturally. Now I'm going to have that on my mind all day. All right. I like the other one about my woman who stayed drunk all the time. Now I got some crummy song from the early 70s. Anyway, All Alone Thursday. And here's why. Woke up this morning and what did I see? An editorial on my beloved bright one, the Chicago Sun-Times. <laughs> slamming the Chicago Public School Teacher, Chicago Teachers Union for uh, threatening to go on strike. It's the second Sun-Times editorial of its kind in the last, I don't know, 10 days or so. Boom, boom. This time they're mad at them for raising the issue of homelessness, even though teachers have to confront the issue of kids who have no home all the time when kids just wander, come to their classroom, moving from one school to the next. It's an issue that confronts teachers, but apparently they shouldn't talk about it with Lori Lightfoot. Then, boom, editorial in the Chicago Tribune, blasting the teachers. I can't even keep up with all the editorials in the Tribune blasting the teachers. I, If you go back historically, I can't recall ever once a Chicago Tribune editorial standing in solidarity with the teachers uh, asking for a raise. I've said this once, I'll say it again. The, I think the first strike was late 60s or so. If the Tribune had its ways, teachers would be making the same salary they were making in 1968. Anyway, this um, this particular editorial said teachers should not go on strike for the kids. Suddenly, the Chicago Tribune is very concerned about the kids. They're just very worried about the kids because the kids cannot miss one day of school if the teachers go on strike. I share their concern. I hope the teachers don't go on strike. But it's really interesting, D, how the Chicago Tribune could love kids so much and have such disdain and, and hostility for the people who teach them. All right. Then we got to John Cass. Uh, young Johnny Cash? Not Johnny Cash, all right? There you go. <laughs> okay. My millennial listeners, wait a minute. Isn't it the man? Ring of, of fire? Yeah, ring of fire. I love that song. No, John Cass. We've dealt with this before, millennials. 
pay attention. Anyway, John Cass writes a column for the Chicago Tribune. As I point out, he's a little to the right of, oh, Mitch McConnell. But I said, well, you know, Cass is going to stand up for the teachers because he likes to be the sort of the voice of the little guy, right? They, you know, he's not going to stand up with the corporate elite of Chicago and uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, the boss of Chicago, right? It's going to be with the teachers, right? Uh-uh, negatory. <laughs> He was right there with the Tribune, <laughs> bashing the teachers. He had an interesting little theory. This is very Chicago, his, uh, his suggestion. Now, follow me on this one, folks. The teachers of Chicago, one of the main issues uh, they're uh, raising and what they probably will go on strike for uh, is they want the, uh, the Board of Education and Chicago Public Schools, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, to put into writing an agreement uh, to hire a certain number of nurses, social workers, and counselors. Uh, this, the city, uh, the public schools of Chicago have been understaffed on this front for years and years and years. So they want to deal with that right now, put it in writing, uh, make it a, a union contra uh, contracted, protected uh, hiring, all right? John Cass's attitude, his idea of the teachers like it so much, they should take a pay cut, pay for themselves. Well, there's an interesting idea. Oh. <laughs> You know, like already teachers right now, you know, they, there's no money for supplies in this dead broke system. You know, you have a lot of friends who are, you have some friends who are teachers. Do you know how teachers do it? They buy the pencils, the paper, you know, the crayons, the stuff they put on the on the walls to decorate. The, that comes out of their pocketbook. For, remember those stories years ago about teachers having to buy the toilet paper and the uh, paper towels and stuff like that. There we go. Now we got it. We're so desperate. We're so broke in the city of Chicago that to get a nurse in a school or get a library in a school, the reigning idea from the uh, Chicago Tribune is that teachers pay for it themselves. Well, next thing you know, teachers are paying for the janitors. How about that, D? Let's just dig a little deep. Teachers pay for the janitor. Well, already, a lot of the teachers have to clean up the rooms themselves. Remember that issue from a few years ago? Very interesting idea from the teachers pay for nurses. Here we go. Because, you know, wouldn't want the taxpayers of Chicago to have to worry about that uh, or, you know, the powers that be, what have you. So interesting, not a lot of allies in the media when it comes to the teachers. In fact, if I didn't know better, D, you know who I'd say was on the side of the teachers? Uh, you. <laughs> and me, <laughs> oh, poor teachers, guys. I hate to say it. Not a lot of friends in the media. You and me, D, that's pretty much it. That's why I said alone again naturally. That's actually not true. Maya comes in the studio on Tuesday. I said, Maya, who, just instinctively, which side are you on? She looked at me like, a teachers, of course. Miles will be in here a little while from in these times. He's on the teacher. D, isn't it interesting? Everybody that's on the side of the teachers the Chicago media could fit into this little studio. <laughs> Oh, gosh, it's so fun. I thought Chicago was supposed to be a working-class union town. Here's the deal, folks. I say this. If we can't afford to hire nurses, and if the reigning idea from the largest newspaper in the city of Chicago is that the teachers should dig in their pockets to pay for the nurses, I have a suggestion. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. We just cut a deal. City of Chicago, taxpayers, like to remind you of this. Tribute doesn't cover this much, but this, uh, we just cut a deal. We're Sterling Bay, the developer, to build a Lincoln Yards in a gentrifying area. And among the other things we're paying for are their lawyers and their flax. $25 million is set aside in that deal for that. So I'll tell you this. If the teachers are going to have to pay for the nurses, I think Sterling Bay should have to pay for their own lawyers. What do you think, D? Isn't that a good idea? Sure. Let's see what the Tribune has to say. Oh, there they are under the table, D. Come on out. Oh, I'm scared. <laughs> uh, teachers paying for nurses. At the table at the Ben Jarofsky <laughs> Show studio. You know what? But we lost the... We, we changed things around, so the cover... At least the, oh, like the yeah, gag. You right are so gag. inside baseball right now. <laughs> Anyway, uh, what a what a warm, uh, friendly town it is in terms of the media's reaction to the teachers. Teachers, pay for your own nurses. We got a great show today, everybody. Miles Camplassen will be here from in these times. Miles, we'll be talking national news and it's Camp Flassen. What did I say? Comp Flassen. I think it's Comp. Nope, it's uh, Camp. I'm gonna bet. I uh, do you not remember what happened last <laughs> week on this show. <laughs> I can't remember what happened yesterday on this show. Uh, uh, Miles Camp Lassen will be here. We're talking teachers. Uh, we're going to be talking. We'll probably talk impeachment with uh, Miles. And, uh, you know, he's got, he wants to talk uh, Ellen and Bush. Yep, there you go. That's Too bad. It. We're talking chicken sandwiches. Uh, uh, and he, he doesn't know that. Or we're going to talk a little uh, uh, 
chicken sandwich with him. Uh, former Governor Pat Quinn will be here. We'll be talking all kinds of politics, state politics, local politics, and uh, Nash, I may ask him an impeachment question or two, get Pat Quinn's thought on the strategy uh, that uh, George, oh, excuse me, George Bush, got my mind uh, on the Ellen conversation, uh, that Donald Trump is employing uh, to stifle and stonewall Democratic congressional investigators. And will Pat Quinn bring a clipboard with him? More than likely. More than, correct. Oh, thank you, Robert Mueller. Uh, and uh, also, uh, Andrea Rayla, property tax expert. We're talking about property taxes. And by the way, Andrea used to work for Pat Quinn. Did you know that, D? Many, many years ago when I first met her, she worked for Pat Quinn. So they'll be like, what do you call that? Crosstalk. Oh, yeah, that's radio. Dude. You are huh? so good at this. It's radio. Why? Oh, anyway, my. Did, ben, you've come a long way. Did I tell you I didn't go to radio school? Tell anyway. us what that is again when uh, two people uh, are talking again. What's Crosstalk. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> You know what these We're are called? ready for the big leagues, buddy. Cans. All oh, right. oh, way to go, Ben. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we got that and much, much more. But before we do any of that, the young man from Alton, Illinois, the pride and joy, yes, indeed, of Southwest High School or Southwestern High School, the doctor with the news. All you have to say is Dennis with the news. <laughs> Waiting for that day. <laughs> How's it going, everybody? We begin with what's happening in Chicago and or Illinois this afternoon. First up, our Illinois Governor, J.B. Pritzker. After years of neglect, Illinois is finally getting its mojo back. His and we're open for business. Oh, yeah, Sorry, J.B., to interrupt almost cut him off there. Oh, my goodness. His Thursday plans involve a trip to Chicago's Thompson Center to release recommendations from the Pension Consolidation Feasibility Task Force. Mm -hmm. Hey, Ben, remember that time a uh, couple of weeks back when the FBI raided the offices of Democratic Illinois Senator Martin Sandoval. Remember that? Yes, indeed. Yeah, me too. Well, we're learning more about the reason why. And sadly for Sandoval, no, this is in fact not one of the most epic birthday pranks of all time. I looked it up on the line. His birthday's in January. Wouldn't oh. make sense to do it now. It's October. So we learned last week that feds were looking for information related to concrete and construction businesses, lobbyists and public officials, and items related to any official action taken in exchange for a benefit. So that was last week, and today, well, the plot thickens. It looks like Crane Chicago Business got the scoop. Damn it! Was it was it Greg Hines, our good friend? I was not Greg Hines, your good friend, and the best poker player in all of Chicago. No, nope. uh, not really, but whatever. <laughs> Let's make. I'm him trying feel to get good. that Greg Hines interview. All right, you oh, keep great. ruining it. Great poker player, Greg. What a great poker face he's got. There you don't know you what he, he he could have two twos or three aces. You wouldn't know from his face. <laughs> I thought you were saying like ballet tutus. Uh, you know what they say. You got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them. And that's Greg what Greg Hines says. He's really good. He knows his poker. All right. I think we're going to get that interview. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> Crane Chicago Business got the scoop here. Comad and Exelon are being asked for records of communications with State Senator Martin Sandoval. Commonwealth Edison, along with parent Exelon, received a grand jury subpoena October 4th requiring, quote, production of records of any communications with certain individuals and entities, including Illinois State Senator Martin Sandoval. The companies disclosed last night in a Securities and Exchange Commission filing. For ComEd and Exelon, it's the second federal subpoena they've received in the past three months. Earlier, they acknowledged requests for information surrounding lobbying activities from the U.S. Attorney's Office in Chicago. Oh, Illinois. <laughs> And that investigation focused at least in part on former Southwest side alderman one Michael Zalewski's efforts to get lobbying work for ComEd, according to reports at the time. Exelon last night even disclosed for the first time that it had established a special oversight committee of its board made up solely of independent directors, quote, to oversee the company's cooperation and compliance with the subpoena. Any further action taken by the U.S. attorney and any resulting actions that may be required or recommended. The committee has retained its own outside counsel, according to the filing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, my advice, we talked about this yesterday with Robert Hergeth, uh, ACE reporter, investigative reporter for the Chicago Sun-Times, a funny little interview where he was talking about the man cave they have in the southwest suburbs. It's a cigar lounge where the pol uh, the political powers that be, you know, they, they descend into the lounge, they hide in the lounge, they cut their deals. That was pretty funny stuff. We don't know exactly what the investigators are looking for. There's bits and pieces, strands of it. We do come well, that is is involved. Uh, there is a, you know, the red light camera company is involved. It's, it seems as though it's a uh, 
it's it's a, a, an investigation that has many different layers to it. But I'd say this: my attitude is, uh, I, I urge uh, Senator Martin Sandoval to employ the Donald Trump technique of responding to uh, investigations. Donald Trump, President of the United States, as you all know, everybody uh, has to has told uh, the congressional investigators who are looking into what he said and what he did in regards uh, to extorting. Uh, dirt of, on Joe Biden from the Ukrainian president. Uh, he says he's not going to cooperate in any way. He essentially uh, gave two middle fingers high to the investigators, said he does not have to abide by their subpoenas. Uh, he does not have to turn over uh, documents or records. Uh, his people who work for him uh, do not have to cooperate, which is really interesting. I mean, you know, if he orders them not to cooperate and they don't cooperate, I think they're still vulnerable. They're exposed uh, to potential, you know, cr criminal liability. So it's very interesting he's saying yeah you should you could go to jail over this but you're gonna do it because i told you to do it uh if i were the lawyer for the employees i'd be advising them to show up and testify but uh i'd urge marty sandoval to try that see how far that gets him the uh you know that technique and by the way see how much support he gets for that technique from uh, the media in this town the chicago tribune well, might as well go back to them speaking of them their editorial board remember they said d they saw they could really see uh nothing too dramatic too dramatically wrong it was wrong that donald trump was uh, apparently attempting uh, to extort information from ukrainian president but there was no quid pro quo so what's the big deal hey maybe they have the same attitude about marty sandoval so if he gives the middle finger to the investigators uh to the feds were looking into them maybe they'll support them who knows uh so anyway that's my advice to marty sandoval once again comment next salon are being asked for records of communications with state senator martin sandoval hey ben remember that time shortly <laughs> after sand what <laughs> what's so funny that's from a movie remember that time shortly after sandoval's offices were raided when our illinois governor jb pritzker in a public statement said that sandoval should Step down as chairman of the Senate Transportation Committee. Remember that? Yes, I do. Yeah, me too. And now more politicians are getting on board with Governor Pritzker. Politicians like Illinois Democratic Controller Susana Mendoza. We, we haven't talked to Mendoza in a while. Have you I, talked to her? Uh, not had a Mendoza report in about three months. Yeah, we got to get on there. Abden. Let's cut a deal. And that's Mendoza's press guy, Abden. Come on, Abden. <laughs> According to NPR Illinois' Brian Mackey, Mendoza says in order to get rid of any clouds over the project, it's time for Sandoval to go. I think that everybody serves in this dome and outside looking in should be very concerned about these allegations. And he should do the right thing and step aside. Mm -hmm. That's what she says. Who else weighs in on this? Democratic Assistant Majority Leader Don Harmon of Oak Park also says, so long, Sandoval. <laughs> he told the Chicago Sun-Times and Tina Svondellis <laughs> yeah. that it's time for Sandoval to step down from the committee. Here's the quote from Harmon. Quote, it would be wise for Marty Sandoval to step down as chair of the Transportation Committee while this investigation unfolds. And surprise, we got an Illinois Republican saying that Sandoval oh, should step surprise. down. Yeah. Not really news, really, but... Here's Republican Senator Bill Brady on Twitter, quote, given the seriousness of this matter and in order to protect the interest of our Illinois residents, I believe he should be removed from serving as chairman of the Transportation Committee or any committee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So those are a few of our pro so long Sandoval politicians. But there are those who think otherwise. A day after the federal raid last month, Senate President John Cullerton called the news, quote, obviously very troubling, but said that he'd wait and see what happens since Sandoval has not been charged. In an updated statement, Cullerton spokesman uh, John Patterson on Wednesday said that the Senate president will continue to monitor the situation. Ride or die, says Cullerton. <laughs> He's riding or die with Sandoval. Well, listen, you know, come all over the map on this one. Uh, on the one hand, any investigation uh, by the feds is serious. And, uh, you know, on the other hand, what, what, what do we say? You're innocent until proven otherwise. So uh, maybe it's a rush to judgment. Um, I would like to remove politics from this equation, D. But just like with, we talk about this all the time with, uh, uh, sexual harassment charges, it seems as though the discussion of what is and isn't proper only takes place on the Democratic side of the aisle. I just want to point out one more time, uh, Donald Trump is under investigation, multiple investigations for all kinds of wrongdoings, all right? Uh, and uh, I don't know any Republican uh, in Congress right now 
uh, or any senator uh, in uh, Congress, uh, in the Senate right now, any Republican senator, who's saying he should step down. So it's always Democrats. I mean, I'm not saying, obviously, that uh, Republicans are only, uh, Republican politicians are the only ones who run a follow the law. I've spent so much of my time chronicling the misdeeds of Democrats in this town. Uh, from mayors to aldermen to state reps, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, but it is curious when it comes to misdeeds by the Republican Party, the Republicans just don't seem to have any standards whatsoever. And they turn on the uh, investigators and attack the investigators. When it comes to Democrats, all the Democrats are saying, well, Marty Sandoval, just the fact that there is an investigation warrants him stepping down. So a curious double standard when it comes to Democrats who uh, have allegations of misdeeds and Republicans. And the Republican in question right here, young Dennis, is the most powerful Republican in the, in the country, the president of the United States, Donald John Trump. So it's just interesting. Once again, I guess it's only Democrats that are held accountable for the misdeeds. Republicans are exempt, I suppose. I guess that's where we are right now in our politics. And one more Democrat is uh, approaching the wait-and-see attitude on Sandoval. It's Democratic Majority Leader Kimberly Lightford of Maywood, and that's Lightford, not Lightfoot. Yes. That's, don't, don't get it twisted don't there. Don't get it twisted. Both Cullerton and Lightford argue that the Southwest Side Democrat, who is also a Majority Caucus whip, has not been charged with any crime. Here's a quote from Lightford, quote, clearly from a social justice perspective, I don't feel comfortable calling for the punishment of someone who hasn't been charged. Yeah, I, well, I kind of agree with her there. Uh, has not uh, been charged, you know, innocent until proven. He's not even, I can't even say he's innocent until proven guilty because he hasn't been charged with anything. So uh, I think Democrats should have sort of the same attitude toward the Democrats who have been who have been under investigation that Republicans have. OK, so when I see the Republican Party rise up as one to, and, and join the investigation uh, into the misdeeds of Donald Trump, then I'll welcome Democrats to do the same. It's interesting. Just double standard. One more time. Uh, Democrats are uh, very cautious about any signs of impropriety in their party. Republicans apparently welcome it in theirs. So there's that, the latest in this ongoing saga with our Illinois senator. We have another piece of the puzzle. But the question still remains. Martin Sandoval, seriously, bro, what the hell did you do? I don't know, we'll have to wait and see. Ooh, wait and see. Wait and see. Maybe he was on the phone with Trump and the Ukrainian president. Oh, you think of that? You think so? Uh, I think that's the fastest way for him to, to go unpunished. If they discovered that the other guy on the line was state senator Martin Santa was Trump, Marty Sandoval, and the president of the Ukraine. Oh, wow. And then you watch all the Republicans. Oh, well, come on, man. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> That's what you should do, Marty. You switch parties. Then you can do whatever you want. You'll never be punished at all. Just join the Republican Party. What will happen? We'll have to wait and see if Sandoval goes with that sound strategy Jarofsky delivered. Flip him the bird. <laughs> I got a feeling that only works for Donald Trump and other Republicans. <laughs> Roy Moore in Alabama. He, uh, he's running again. He looks like he's going to be the uh, Senate, the Republican Senate candidate in uh, Alabama. So yeah, Republicans have a curious attitude about misdeeds in their party. Uh, but Democrats are quite concerned about uh, any allegation against Marty Sandoval. Sandoval, if you're listening and you're thinking about doing that strategy been suggested, <laughs> talk with some people who may, uh, I don't know. I don't Get know. a lawyer. That may not be a good idea. I don't know. Jury's well, still out. It's still working. Working for Trump. <laughs> it's doing well. Uh, you know, it's doing okay for Donald. All right, moving on to the mayor. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Mayor Lori Lightfoot's Thursday's plans involve a visit to William H. Prescott Elementary School to deliver remarks at the National Blue Ribbon School Award celebration. In the evening, she'll deliver remarks at the Chicago Public Library Foundation's Carl Sandburg Awards Dinner at University of Illinois at Chicago's Doran Forum where author George R. R. Martin, a.k.a. the Game of Thrones guy, will be honored. Ben, I know you love Game of Thrones. You're going to be at this event, right? Uh, no, negatory. You know, I've never seen a, an episode of Game of Thrones. Have Me, you? Oh, I've seen the last one, and I saw, the, I saw it for like maybe 10 minutes, and I fell asleep. Yeah, no. So anyway, but you're uh, not going to this event tonight. You're going to be at sidetrack. That tonight. is correct. Yeah. I'll be at sidetrack with Maya. We'll be uh, interviewing various activists uh, in the city of Chicago, the LGBTQ community, and uh, getting ready for the town, uh, the town hall forum. CNN is sponsoring. So yes, that's where I'll be, and I'll miss that function at the uh, library. We encourage you all to join us if you got no plans. Thirty-three forty-nine North Halstead in Chicago and Boys Town. Sidetrack. 
yeah, it's going to be a good time. Maya Duke Moss will be there. And you can congratulate Maya if you're there on her new uh, gig as the uh, first Tuesday co-host, having to deal with Ben once a month. <laughs> Uh, well, she actually has to deal with me uh, once a week because she comes in every Tuesday at this oh, show. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, no, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Mike Dumkey has left the the show, unfortunately uh, for me. But on the good news front, I got uh, Maya will be uh, my co-host. So I'm looking forward to it. I think we'll be talking teacher strike. Uh, hopefully there will be no teacher strike. That's, I'm rooting for it. I, I'm hoping they cut a deal. Uh, and that Lori Lightfoot's going to a school, did you say today? Yep. Uh, it's clearly to, uh, you know, identify herself as somebody who cares about public schools as we head into this contentious last few days uh, before a potential strike. So I'm hoping there will not be a strike, but uh, one way or the other, we'll be dis discussing the relationship between Chicago's teachers and Chicago Public School and the mayors at the next um, uh, hideout show, first and Tuesday. And a certain 2020 presidential candidate will be showing up at Sidetrack tonight. Which explains why Ben's wearing that nice shirt today. <laughs> I wore one yesterday. Oh, I, Marianne Williamson. By the way, where's your tie? Huh? <laughs> where's your tie? I, you got to see Marianne Williamson tonight. You're not wearing a tie? Uh, you know, she mm -hmm. likes the casual look I've heard. I don't know. All right, so Mayor Lori Lightfoot's Thursday plans involve uh, that visit to the school. Uh, and let's see here. Oh, no new updates on the looming Chicago teacher strike, but we do have a Chicago budget update. Oh, okay. Yeah, remember, everyone, the city of Chicago is currently facing an $838 million budget deficit, and we have been anxiously awaiting for plans to try and get us out of this hole. Vinny J, we got one plan, all right? One plan here. That's good. Mm -hmm. Mayor Lori Lightfoot wants to merge two city departments to save $1 million. Lightfoot announced plans Wednesday to consolidate the Chicago Department of Innovation and Technology with fleet and facility management, but the administration said any merger would need to be approved by the city council and would take effect in 2020. So consolidating the Chicago Department of Innovation and Technology with fleet and facility management. Ben, what do you think of this idea? Good, bad, don't care? Uh, save a million dollars, a million here, a million there. You can hire some t nurses, <laughs> okay? You know, it adds up. Uh, so I welcome, by the way, I've been critical of Mayor uh, Lori Lightfoot and her stance toward uh, uh, the teachers in terms of hiring the nurses and the social workers and the counselors and the librarians, et cetera, and dealing with class size. Just wrote that uh, in the reader as well. A couple last couple reader columns have been critical of the mayor's position uh, on these issues. But I have to give her a shout out. Um, and Mayor Lori Lightfoot, the story in both papers, the Tribune and the Sun-Times today, uh, the city released the files on the Laquan McDonald shooting and interesting, disturbing stuff in there about uh, records being, dis I'll, read, I'll just read you the Tribune lead, which kind of sums it up, uh, Jeremy Gorner, uh, Jeremy Gorner and John Burns lead in, uh, in the Tribune. Chicago still simmering over the fatal police shooting of 17-year-old Laquan McDonald when the city's watchdog finished an in-depth review of the case and determined police officers lied about what they saw and changed or destroyed evidence resulting in a massive cover-up of a brazen shooting. Yes, indeed, uh, that uh, story still uh, is with us. And uh, the Tribune, uh, excuse me, the, um, the Sun-Times the Tribune have uh, details of the Inspector General's report that the Inspector General Joseph Ferguson uh, undertook in the, in the aftermath of Laquan McDonald's shooting. And it was kept secret by Mayor Rahm, uh, Lori Lightfoot released it. So kudos to Lori Lightfoot uh, on, on the public records front there. The more transparency we have, the better, I say, D. Let in the light. Isn't that what Lori Lightfoot always says? Yeah. Let in the light. So uh, kudos to Lori Lightfoot for doing making This good little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. There you go. Making good on a promise. All right. So that's what's going on in Chicago and or Illinois this afternoon. We now go to you, the Ben Jarofsky Show listener. I'm looking at the Ben Jarofsky Show Facebook page, which, by the way, you should go to at Benny J Show, B-E-N-N-Y, the letter J Show. Uh, when we hit 2,100 likes, we will have our next caption contest. And right now I'm looking at the page. We're almost there, people. We are at 2,080. Whoa. Three likes. Dang, 17 away. So there you go. Head over to the Ben Jarofsky Show Facebook page. It's Give me us a like. Adding more. Likes. Do it again. <laughs> Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. I can picture that in my head. Uh, did good. I tell you that I got a woman stay drunk all the time? No, you G don't. G G G G G G G Sorry. Your woman does not stay <laughs> drunk all the time. I've met her. She's very nice. <laughs> I don't think she'd like you saying that. Uh, it's a Led Zeppelin song, guys. That's what he's referring to. Uh, so, yeah, we're at 2083. Head over to the Ben Jarofsky Show Facebook page if you've yet to do that. Give us a like. Tell your friends, by the way. And when we hit 2100 likes, we will have our next caption contest. 
Uh, ben, what are you feeling on the next caption contest? Any ideas that, uh, for the picture that we should post on the page? Uh, excuse me, local or national? I'd say. Well, we did Lightfoot last oh, time. Oh, then we got to go Donnie. Lightfoot and Ivanka. So you want to go Donald Let's Trump? Let's go Donnie. Let's go Donnie Trump. Well, I'm trying to know. think before we decide on that. We, okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I like that. By the way, uh, I urge everybody to check out last week's uh, download, the bonus special. Jim Coogan really takes apart, uh, Ace Attorney takes apart uh, the. Uh, the Trump impeachment. The, how is this legal is the question we ask. And I'm really looking forward to this one of our most popular uh, guests on a bonus time, Neil Muhammad, who's one of the smartest people in the state of Illinois, I think we'll all agree. He ran for Congress in the 16th Congressional District. Uh, and he's coming in tomorrow. We're going to have a wide ranging talk. I talked to Neil today about some of the issues we're going to be talking about, but uh, everything from Syria to China to the presidential primary and to impeachment. So some good bonus stuff, good bonus material coming. And am I allowed to say it, even though it's a sports related? thing oh yeah can go i ahead. say it do i have yeah. permission we had a delightful conversation with joe cowley uh chicago sun times beat reporter covers the bulls my beloved chicago bulls and dennis has given us a special uh, uh, uh allowance okay uh to, uh to talk about chicago bulls basketball we did it once before with joe cowley so it's a bonus segment if you're not into it you don't even have to listen to it folks but uh <laughs> if you are into basketball it is a delightful conversation joe cowley does not pull any punches it was a blast talking to him so that'll i don't know if we're going to download that because i think we're going to be downloading the marion williamson uh interview are we not young man uh, i'm gonna try you know i'm gonna hopefully uh, when we get to the event i'll be able to record it and it'll sound decent so, you know, if it sounds good, I'll post it. If it sounds like crap, I'm not going to post it. You know what I mean? Yes, indeed. So all these decisions will be uh, decided tomorrow. A lot of tension. Oh, there. by the way, I've been working on a, a new int uh, an intro for that segment. Is this legal with Jim Coogan? So you ask, is, do it, is this legal? Do it real quick. Is this legal? Well, oh, yesterday oh, was try it again. Try it again. I okay. really lost sleep last night. Do it again. Is this legal? Yeah. Whoa. That's pretty cool, right? It is really good. Hey, JC, Jimmy Coogan, you hear that? <laughs> All right. Is this legal with Jim Coogan? All right. And hey, uh, for our next caption contest, uh, we're thinking Donald Trump. But if you have a better suggestion, head over to uh, the YouTube live stream. I'll, I'll, if you're uh, listening on the live stream right now, give us a suggestion. What should we do for our next uh, caption contest? We're thinking Trump. Anybody else that we're leaving out that made the news in the last few months that possibly we can have a caption contest for? Head over to the live stream chat. Let us know. Or the Ben Jarofsky Show Facebook page if you're listening on the download. That'd be cool. All right. So let's go back to uh, reading the comments here from everybody. Uh, Amelia weighed in. She says, love your show. I learn a lot. Thank you, Amelia. That's really nice of you. That's cool. All right. On to uh, the YouTube live stream chat. We got people weighing in here. We got Daniel. Daniel says, hey, Ben. That's it? Hey, Daniel. And he says, Aunt Dennis, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's like that Norm Macdonald bit, but I'm going to not go there. <laughs> and he says, uh, Daniel says, the Chicago media is going hard for Lori versus the CTU, but I haven't personally talked to anyone who is super pro Lori here. More often than not, people don't realize that a strike is on the horizon. Yeah, I, it's a good point, Daniel. May. First of all, yeah, we talked about this already. We're alone again, naturally. One of the few uh, voices in the media right here that uh, is generally supportive of the teachers uh, as opposed to taking a pro Lori stance, which I think, we would all agree that uh, most of the mainstream media has done uh, just that. I See, I'm in a bubble here. Uh, and the bubble is, is that I live on the north side of Chicago. And the north side of Chicago in these matters tends to be more conservative than the rest of the city. Uh, they, the folks, it just seems like they align with the mayor, whoever the mayor is. I remember back in 2012, so many people that I just bumped into in the course of the day were supportive of Rahm and a little irritated at Karen Lowe. Blame me because I was openly supportive of the teachers. Like, you know, somehow or other, I had this influence with Karen Lewis, which obviously I did not, because uh, I didn't want the teachers to go on strike in 2012 any more than anybody else did. Uh, but um, so they would say, Ben, can't you talk to your friend? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll, I'll call her up right now and tell her to call off the strike. Uh, but I get the same vibe, uh, D, so, so many times where I go, I go, people are saying to me, you know, I just don't understand these teachers. It's uh, uh, you know, hard. I don't get it. I didn't get that much raise, or uh, they getting enough money, or I don't understand why they're going on strike. So my guess is, uh, is that if there there may be a split in uh, the view of this, um, this is definitely an issue worth exploring. A north side view versus a rest of the city view in terms of uh, the teacher strike. But listen, f f just random conversations that I have with just uh, 
people I bump into on the north side of Chicago who vote liberal when it comes to presidential races, but are a little more conservative when it comes to local issues, it seems that these people are on the side of Lori and don't have a lot of sympathy uh, for Chicago's teachers. All right, we got Miles Complassen in studio. We're going to be talking with him after this short little break, but I got to remind all you podcast fans. I'm assuming you're fans because you said Miles Complassen. Ah, oh, it's Cam Flassen. Damn, you I do it too. Say, see, <laughs> see, damn, <laughs> just saying. All right, podcast fans, I'm assuming you're a fan because you're listening to this podcast. The team at the Chicago Sun-Times have a new show to add, two new shows to add to your listening lineup. In fact, I'm going to tell you about this first one. This football season, get the inside scoop on the Chicago Bears with Hallis Intrigue. It's the latest podcast from the Chicago Sun-Times. You can tune in to hear Sun-Times sports reporters and Bears experts uh, what they do is they evaluate the games, make predictions, provide insights. They do things that you hear on a, on a podcast. They analyze the day's big stories, and you can stay informed this football season with them. Just listen to Hallis Intrigue at suntimes.com forward slash Hallis, and be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Check it out now at suntimes.com forward slash Hallis. Isn't that right, Robert Mueller? That's correct, folks. <laughs> and another podcast that's out now <laughs> with the Chicago Sun-Times. She comes into our studio now every Friday, so, Ben, let's make sure we clean it up and make it yeah, nice for her when she comes yeah, in. Yeah, right. It's going to yeah. be her first weekend, you know what I mean? Let's move some of those papers yeah, over Yeah, we got to move some of that yeah, stuff. Yeah. Uh, Fran Spielman, she's going to be having a podcast now. She, you were used to her on the YouTube videos. She's moving from that format and now into podcast format. Once a week, the same Fran Spielman show that you've, uh, you're familiar with. She talks one-on-one. -on -one with a uh, newsmaker of the week in the Chicago news. And uh, it's going to be a podcast format now. We're going to try and play some of the, the Fran Spielman show. We're going to have it featured on our page as well. Good interviews. She's yeah, got yeah. good interviews. It's new Fran Spielman show on the podcast, uh, suntimes.com. Look for the Fran Spielman show. A new podcast episode this Friday. Who's our guest? You're going to have to wait to find out, everybody. It's a mystery. Mm, mystery <laughs> guest. Ooh, yeah. who will Fran have on? I don't know. So there you go. Coming up. Miles Kampflassen of In These Times Magazine. It's the Ben Jarofsky Show live from the Chicago Sun-Times. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Everybody, what you're about to hear are the piano stylings of Jeff Manuel. Man, listen to Jeff go. Jeff Manuel has been playing piano around Chicago for years. He's played for conventions, for celebrities, played in basement bars with blues bands. He's played at prestigious social clubs, fine restaurants, and in the intimacy of private homes. Book Jeff Manuel at jeffemanuelpianist.com. Don't worry, I'll spell his name at the end of this commercial. You know what Chicago Magazine said? They said that Jeff Manuel is, quote, as comfortable with Chopin as he is with Cole Porter. He's excellent and his performance is joyous. He offers an elegant stream of compositions and interpretations that entertains the mind but won't hurt the ears. To hear more of Jeff Manuel's work and to book Jeff for your next event, go to jeffmanuelpianist.com. I'm going to spell it out for you people. J E F F. M as in Mary, A, N as in Nancy, U, E, L, P, I, A, N, I, S, T, dot com. Take it away, Jeff Manuel. Welcome back to the Ben Jarofsky Show, live from the Chicago Sun-Times. Miles Camp Lassen in the studio in these times. Ace journalist, also in Jacobin Magazine, uh, comes on the show every Thursday to talk about the issues of the day. I got you down, Miles, to talk impeachment. Uh, I, I, we, we, we did a deep dive on Monday, uh, uh, Micah and Miles, uh, two of the biggest Bernie supporters I know. Micah just wrote a book about Bernie. Uh, and uh, I just saw this release. So, even though I didn't tell you I was going to talk Bernie, I just see you and I instantly think Bernie. 
and uh, there were, I think uh, it's the hair. Is it the hair? The crazy it's hair. It's just the love for Bernie Sanders. Yeah, yeah, it's the crazy hair. They uh, both got one. And what a what a rough. I mean, just like a rough week for Bernie Sanders. I just know he he had the heart attack. It, uh, it knocked him out of the uh, off the campaign trail. Uh, and now he's determined to come back because he, he does not want to lose any more momentum. I'm not even sure it's wise for him to rush back. Uh, he released a video today. I don't know if you saw it, or at least I saw it today. I don't know when he released it. It shows him hitting a baseball. Did you see this video? Uh, to sort of suggest that he's back in full health. Yeah. Uh, he's got a nice swing. I got to give him credit for that. But in addition to that, and uh, his his a daughter-in-law just died of yeah. cancer. So it's just a really rough week for Bernie Sanders. Uh, so my heart goes out for him. I got Bernie Sanders on the front line. And it was interesting, yesterday uh, we had uh, on the show Sergio Mims, um, who is uh, uh, a, a, uh, the director, the co-founder of the Black Harvest Film Festival. Anyway, he started talking about Bernie, and he was saying that it, he voted for Bernie last time. He thought, like, Bernie's time had passed. You know, that's how he viewed it. Like, uh, it's just unfortunate. He felt that Bernie would have won. He agrees with you that Bernie would have won had Bernie been the nominee. Um, and uh, it just seems, it's so unfortunate. I'm really going to look forward to seeing how he does next week's debate. That's a week from today, I want to say, or maybe it's Wednesday, whatever. Um, to you know, I think America, a lot of voters will be looking to see how much vibrancy he has, how cogent he is. Is it the old Bernie? Does he have that fire? Um, I think, I think in, to a large degree, uh, you could say that his performance in that debate will shape uh, his campaign going forward. Sure. I think that, you know, what we have seen from Bernie Sanders since he was released from the hospital is that he, you know, he's says he's going to hit the right back on the campaign trail and uh, keep on going with this thing. And I think, you know, we should believe him. He's certainly um, gone outside of uh, beyond expectations in the past. And, you know, this is a, this is a primary. The first uh, votes are not going to be until February. So I think it's very early to be writing out anybody, especially when they just released, you know, the biggest fundraising numbers, the most donors ever for a, you know, presidential candidate. Um, he's also, you know, still at the top of the polls, um, you know, right, right up there with Biden and Warren, especially in the early states. Um, and he has a million volunteers, you know, so <laughs> there's people that are ready to hit the doors and, you know, they're doing it already. They're doing phone calls. So I don't think that it's, I think it's very early to, you know, know out anybody especially when there's somebody as vibrant as bernie sanders and you know it's, it's a primary of ideas i think that that's um a very fair thing you know it's not about one candidate that's why bernie always says not me us um you know other candidates have taken up the torch for some of his ideas but as you can see when you kind of go down the list uh they tend to equivocate and get you know they they talk about medicare for all as a framework versus an actual bill you know that's out right now in the senate that could be implemented they talk about um, you know, free college tuition, but with all these various ramifications, you know, you got to have a Pell Grant and do all these things to get your student debt eliminated. You know, Bernie's running on very universalist programs that I think are setting the standard. Um, so I don't think it's fair to say that, you know, he or everybody else is running on his same platform. He has really distinguished himself, especially on foreign, on the issues of foreign policy. And when it comes to housing, you know, he has put forward a plan for social housing, for universal rent control nationally. So I think there's plenty of issues voters will have the chance to judge um, who has the better vision for the country. I think it's understandable to look at a candidate's health. That's, you know, perfectly fine. But you know, we'll see if he's, you know, he, uh, even the journalists who were covering him on the beat said he was doing more events than any other candidate on the trail. You know, he was doing four to five big events a day. For example, he, his staff has said they don't want him to go out at night because of the, and do, do late in the day um, events because of all the gaffes, you know, his, his <laughs> he has, he has a lot of trouble. Yeah. So. I don't think, you know, I think it's understandable, but, you know, Dick Cheney had nine heart attacks. You know, Ronald Reagan had polyps removed while he was in office. D you know, Bill Clinton suffered, you know, many health scares and Joe Biden had a brain aneurysm in 1988 that almost killed him. So I'm not saying that, you know, all these other people are, you know, therefore d deeply damaged, but we should look holistically and say, you know, a heart attack is a big deal. But if we, if he's come back and, you know, he has these stents put in and you know people can live very very long lives after a heart attack and be perfectly healthy so we'll see all right uh since we're talking national state national for a while before i come back to the teacher strike and my sense of feeling all alone uh in terms <laughs> of voicing support for the teachers uh but you raise this to me and and uh i've not talked about this in the show at all 
I've been reading about it, think about it, talk about friends uh, with it. Ellen DeGeneres uh, sit down with George W. Bush caused quite a fear on Twitter and the social media. What's your general thoughts on this? Well, so just to set the stage a little bit, you know, what happened is that uh, Ellen was photographed next to W uh, last Sunday at the Cowboys game. We should mention, and they were there sitting in the suite together. We should mention it was the suite owned by Jerry Jones, who is the uh, owner of the Cowboys. He is also a billionaire who made his money as an oil executive, you know, plundering the earth through um, uh, extracting fossil fuels. He also has been accused of sexual misconduct. He's, you know, maybe not the best, you know, person to be which is why Ellen said she was there in the first place and she was, you know, seated next to George Bush. This isn't the first time that they've had an interaction. He was on her show um, fairly soon after the inauguration of Trump um, and they were joking about how he had trouble putting on a poncho, you know, kind of lighthearted banter. I think we need to, you know, what's most dangerous about this to me is that, you know, this rehabilitation of George Bush and the entire Bush administration um, really, it, it distorts history, for one, um, the fact that George W. Bush is a war criminal. There was a seven-member tribunal in Kuala Lumpur in 2011 that said he and Tony Blair had both committed crimes against peace. Um, five, you know, over 5,000 uh, American soldiers, nearly 5,000 American soldiers died in the Iraq war. Over 30,000 were injured and over a million Iraqis were dead as a result of that. And Bush, you know, lied us into that war. And when we paper over these things, like uh, Ellen has done, that really, the, the danger of it is, and you know, the crimes go on, we can go from Katrina, we can look at, you know, the torture regime that was set up around the world with Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay, um, and destroying, you know, America's credibility around the world. Um, when we don't hold these types of officials to justice that have committed such crimes, we just see them regurgitate. And that's what we're seeing under Trump. The same people under um, George Bush, people like John Bolton, are then you know back in another administration and they're able to do the same kind of misdeeds that they were doing before. So that's really what upsets me the most. And you know, Ellen's defense is we're friends. You know, we got to be friends with people that are different from us. Well, you know, it's not just that they have different views of the world. One of these people, you know, George W. Bush has uh, he he spent his life working to destroy the lives of people in the Middle East and in North Africa. And that was, you know, the result of it through the Iraq war. You could say that, you know, he was just kind of bumbling and that it was Dick Cheney behind it all or something like that. But that doesn't change the fact that this guy was a president and he was widely despised. That's the reason Barack Obama won is because of his courageous, you know, stand against the Iraq war. People paper over that when we look back at history and we think of Trump as an aberration. Well, George W. Bush was really a monster in office. And, you know, the fact that he's able to retain a relationship with Ellen and her using that as a way to say, you know, bizism is we all, we can't see eye to eye and we can't talk to people that disagree with us. Well, that is, that widely, you know, distorts the whole uh, debate. You know, mm -hmm. people are mad at George W. Bush, not because of, you know, he's uh, con has conservative beliefs, but because of his actions in office and the true havoc and devastation it caused for working people. Well, it, it, you mentioned the war and we have not talked about the uh, what, Syria at all on the show yet. Tomorrow we'll be doing a, a, a deeper discussion. This would bring in uh, Neil Muhammad, the headline in the paper right here, Turkey attacks U.S. ally in Syria. Uh, and this is all the end, end results of uh, uh, Donald Trump's decision uh, that he's going to pull American soldiers out of the northeastern corner of Syria, thus uh, leaving uh, it, that area open for Turkey to attack uh, the Kurds, uh, who had been America's allies, U.S. allies, uh, in, in the fighting that had gone on there for the last, oh, I don't know, uh, at least uh, eight, 10 years. And what, part of what, this is what's it's very ironic, uh, uh, Miles, part of what Donald Trump is reacting to is the war that George Bush ignited back in 2003 when he had the United States invade Iraq. I'm not even talking about the Afghanistan invasion, which followed right after 9-11, uh, yeah. uh, which had a very specific purpose, uh, which is to uh, unroot um, uh, bin Laden's uh, base of operation in Afghanistan yeah. with the notion that the, if he un, un, if you move him from Afghanistan, he will not have any more attacks in the United States. Put that to his side. We all know, know that there was a manufactured war in, in 2003, and thousands and thousands of lives were lost, millions and millions of dollars squandered, so much devastation. We're still seeing the consequences of it right now in the Middle East, and uh, to a large degree, 
Donald Trump, it, you could make a case, I'm not going to make this case, but you can make a case that he is, quote unquote, the anti-war president, mm -hmm. because he's just saying, we're just uh, going to leave the area. You could say also he's an isolationist. You could say also he's, he's with Donald Trump, there's also a possibility that he's just lost his mind. Uh, he's got this weird love for the Turkish president. Who who knows? It could be being blackmailed. You never know with Donald Trump what his That's motives true, are. That's true, but I, I would just push back in that, you know, the, there has been a bipartisan effort and, you know, it was led by Bernie Sanders, but it included people like Mike Lee from Utah as well on the Republican side. Stop stop this disastrous war in Yemen and the U.S. Fun continued funding of the Saudi-led war there. And Trump, uh, you know, put out the veto threat. He does not want to carry out a real peace operation that would um, pull back American military operations. He also pulled out of the Iran, you know, nuclear deal, which leads us closer to the brink of war. Um, he also appointed John Bolton, yes, somebody did. who said that they wanted to destroy North Korea as his national security advisor. These aren't the kind of things to me that what an anti-war president would do. So I think it's understandable to look, you know, at, you know, what, what this president has done, certainly versus the last uh, Republican president who was a diehard neocon and staffed his administration with people like Donald Rumsfeld. Um, and Dick Cheney, you know, th th you can you can look at and compare the two and say Trump has not led us into, you know, the Iraq war, which I think most people would agree was the most disastrous foreign policy venture so far of the 21st century. There's been nothing like that under Trump. Um, but it seems a big stretch to me. No, to I, I, it is a big stretch, but I will, uh, like I said, there's like five possible reasons why Trump did made that decision. Yeah. Uh, probably more than five. Well, if I from, started from what I understand too, I, it's the, I don't think those troops were brought back to America. They were just put elsewhere in Syria. So I don't think that this was, uh, you know, pulling out of American operations. And I think you're very correct to cite um, American intervention abroad as one of the primary causes of the political turmoil that's existing in that region. I think the other thing, of course, is, you know, climate change. And there's, a, you know, mass climate refugees that flowed into Syria um, throughout, you know, because of the mass uh, droughts that have happened as a result of the, you know, what's going on with the environment. So I think there's many reasons we can uh, point to in, for all of these conflicts. I, and I, it's just that when I look at George W. Bush and his tenure in office, and I look at Donald Trump, uh, and I, I want to resist this temptation that so many Democrats have to say that all the like, evil or wrongness uh, or dysfunction of the Republican Party began with Donald Trump, as though the Iraqi War of 2003, the indifference to Katrina, all the things that you just cited were not factors uh, in... Uh, uh, in the, in the Bush presidency, I mean, and and it's it's ironic. George Bush got reelected in two thousand four uh, in large part of thanks to a, 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 a tactics designed by Karl Rove to take advantage of antipathy that people had in swing states like Ohio and North Carolina to gay marriage. And that well, was exactly. Key, I mean, that's the thing. George key, George W. Bush was pushing a constitutional amendment to ban gay marriage. You know, and this is the person that now because he's now you know a painter and has become this more lovable uh figure in some circles well those circles are the same ultra rich elites that you know ellen is hanging out with at jerry jones is sweet that doesn't reflect i think how most people approach politics there has to be conflict and we have to have you know political opponents and enemies and if there if if you're you know call yourself some believes in social justice and in you know a, a more positive vision for the world you can't count george w bush among the people within your circle that's that's how i feel yeah maybe she, maybe she actually doesn't view herself that way yeah. uh and i also remember uh, uh oprah a key interview she gave with george w bush and, and during the presidential race of 2000 was pivotal uh in uh, sort of shaping his image of as a compassionate conservative yeah. uh that was a very important interview that she gave uh and that was such a close election ultimately it was decided by the supreme court so every vote counted so that had a role as well but it is it is really the impulse that we have i mean every do you have any republican friends um, I don't think openly Republican friends. I actually uh, just got my friend is trying to link me up with a friend of his who was a, uh, a, a, so said that they were a lefty and then got into law and 
a right winger and I'm supposed to have a sit down with them. I don't know what will come of that. Uh, I, I have many uh, libertarian friends, but uh, I don't know many people that openly say I'm a Republican. Yeah. A couple of them. But, yeah. uh, I mean, it's Chicago. It's hard to find. It's hard to find. All right. Well, 20% of, I believe, was voted for uh, Donald Trump, I think. That's off the top of my head. I could be inflating uh, that number. All right. Let's talk impeachment. Yeah. Um, Donald Trump. Uh, part of the reason why that uh, uh, Donald Trump is viewed more negatively uh, than George Bush is that he's so caustic. Oh, my goodness. This is just his his uh, exclamation yesterday about Steve Kerr. Uh, no, and, and Popovich? And Popovich. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Coming after NBA. two of the most beloved <laughs> NBA coaches. Yeah, and uh, it's just he, he, he presents himself in a way that George Bush never would, uh, even if George Bush was launching wars. It's true. I mean, he, he's certainly more vulgar and more straightforward in his political beliefs than, than Bush was, but that doesn't mean that he's, you know, uh, therefore that, that that's the major infraction. I think the ultimate the result of your policies are. But you know what's going on? What I find incredible, the, the news today is that there's these two guys, um, these uh, Soviet-born associates of Giuliani, um, Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman. And if you look at these guys, they, they have the mugshots out and they look like literal goons. You know, these are <laughs> really horrible looking individuals. And they were associates of Giuliani who apparently were involved in some of these efforts to get Ukraine to uh, investigate uh, Biden's and also were working to be able to export liquid natural gas from the um, Ukrainian owned national uh, reserve so that you know they had this whole financial operation set up the reason that they were arrested they were trying to leave the country we don't know if they were trying to flee but you know they were at Dulles airport and that's where they got picked up um, and it's for campaign violations campaign finance violations we don't know the extent of those but these were people that were very close to Rudy Giuliani for a long time and Giuliani has kind of been the linchpin in this whole thing and that he's you know he was out there bragging about trying to go big dig up dirt in the Ukraine uh, and it's incredible to see Trump double down on this now and say, you know, asking China to dig up dirt on the Bidens now. It's just completely flaunting the law and then refusing to turn over any documents or allow anybody in his administration to be subpoenaed. Uh, he's basically testing the legal system, I think, because he knows that uh, this will just go to the Supreme Court ultimately. And the Supreme Court, as we understand from recent decisions, is going to side with him. Um, so that's his that's his bet. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think it's probably a correct bet, and that you know, if if he just keeps resisting um, these demands from the House Democrats, that's just where it's going to wind up. And it's similar to the approach of Brett Kavanaugh. You know, they just refused to budge at all. They defended him to, um, and and then tried to discredit Christine Blasley Ford and all of you know uh, Kavanaugh's accusers, and just stuck with him and tried to demonize and made it into sounding like a political act impeachment of course there's politics involved you know it's not as if it's not in the way we know that is because of the uh, folks that are there's only seven democrats now in the house that don't support an impeachment inquiry and there's one um amash uh, independent from uh, independent yeah from michigan mm -hmm. who's, who's not running for re-election yeah, yeah. exactly uh so you know in that sense it is political but that's just their whole thing is oh it's a witch hunt you know it's what's funny too i should mention that the witch hunt phrase was the same one used by the head of the fop today I that, yeah. He's talking about the release of the Laquan McDonald video, um, so you could, you could tell Not the, the, trickle the video, down. but the documents, the, the, uh, documents the internal right. investigation by Joseph Ferguson. Yeah, exactly. uh, uh, he said, uh, uh, we, uh, "All right, I'm going to uh, make a bet with you, or uh, maybe we should wait, hold off on this one. I'm not uh, ready to say uh, that the Supreme Court will rule with Trump." Now, let's back up for a moment. Um, I do believe that ultimately, if, if there is a strategy to what Donald Trump is doing other than utter madness, which is always, like I said, when I talked about what he did uh, in, uh, with Syria and Turkey and the Kurds, there's always the pot pot potential, there's like five po possibilities that I can rattle off. Uh, but when I get to his, his strategy for dealing with the congressional investigators and the stonewalling and his determination uh, not to resist them at every turn, not turn over any documents, drag out the clock, uh, fire up his base with talk yeah. of a witch hunt. If um, My guess is that ultimately uh, his strategy is, uh, is linked to a feeling that the Supreme Court will rule in his favor uh, on the issue of whether he has to turn over documents yeah. and evidence, if there's any thought whatsoever to the strategy. Yeah. Well, I'm, the, the, I'm, yeah. go, I'm not ready to concede that. I'm not ready to say, I understand Kavanaugh 
uh, will go his way. Uh, Alito will probably Gorsuch. go his way. Uh, uh, Gorsuch will go his way. And, of course, Clarence, there's no doubt Clarence Thomas will go his way. I'm not sure this, the John Roberts, yeah. the uh, chief justice, who's more of a mainstream Republican. He's become more of a kind of the swing vote, which is this, what we saw with the Obamacare ruling yes. as well. Yeah. So I'm not certain that he is going to sanction. Well, the other thing, though, is just they could just play this out and extend it through the next election, right? I mean, that's that's a quite possible result as well, because Mitch McConnell's not going to actually bring this up for a Senate vote. The, w w the difference is that now, so the House has, the House has started these impe this impeachment uh, inquiry proceedings. They've not had an official vote on it. There's nothing in the Constitution saying you need to you need to vote to impeach, of course, in the Constitution, but you don't need to vote to start an investigation yes. into impeachment. Mm -hmm. So, but now with this announcement today, um, of the vote counts, they do have a majority, which is all you need to open, you know, to, to go forward with that. So Nancy Pelosi might decide to do that. As you also saw yesterday, the Fox News poll came out yes. showing that there's, you know, in a Fox News poll, there's record support for uh, impeachment and not just the impeachment inquiry, but actually like impeachment, impeachment. and removal. For what he tweeted denouncing yeah. Fox. Yeah, and what did he say? He said, "Well, I'm president. Too bad, or something like that." Yeah, I know. Like they're not cut uh, from the same cloth, part yeah. of the same team. But uh, yeah, so that's that's also part of it. Now, I want to. You mentioned Mitch McConnell. I want to get your thoughts uh, on this. I have had this conversation with many people uh, in the aftermath of. Uh, to stand back and pull uh, troops out of the area, yeah. the northeast corner of Syria, and allow Turkey to invade uh, without fear of any direct confrontation with the United States, uh, thus igniting a direct war with Kurds and Turkey in that corner of Syria. Uh, many Republicans have spoken out. Yeah. Uh, and uh, people say, well, look, this Trump finally went too far. I, I understand why people, uh, I mean, it's just the way the United States has betrayed allies. Uh, I don't know how you could run a sane foreign policy with one day you're pledging your undying support to your ally who's on a battlefield with you, and then the next day you're like backing away and letting that person uh, f face bombs, you know, jet planes bombing them. So I, I can understand why there would be a feeling of... Um, decision but i love to how deep do you think this opposition from the mitch mcconnell's of the world uh is to what trump has done uh with in any way they wouldn't just you know lightly chastise him they would actually work to you know prevent his policies from going forward and that could come to not confirming nominees that could come to you know having their own investigations into these things I mean, there's the republicans hold the power in the u.s senate right now they they have power of the purse you know they can control money that goes into war making and they've been completely unwilling to be any type of a accountability mark on this president and they're signing off on these new you know 700 billion dollar defense authorization acts that doesn't sound like you know the type of people that actually have a problem with how the president is running his foreign policy i mean i agree with you about this is it's a betrayal if anything and that you know we had the, the kurds were the only real allies in helping to um provide um, support in Syria, and yet now they've been cast off, and uh, Turkey has already started their incursion. So that is a uh, travesty, and it's really people should be, I think, upset about how the the president has operated. But I don't trust Mitch McConnell to be any type of a counterweight to this president as long as he's being allowed to get these uh, judges confirmed. You know, like that's Mitch McConnell's whole thing you know his years long decades long plan has been to capture the judici judiciary for the conservatives for the foreseeable future and that is what he's accomplishing through all these lifetime appointments that he's getting through meanwhile destroying the regulatory state as we see through what's happening at the epa mm -hmm. and so many different agencies that are just being defunded and positions left open and that's going to wreak havoc for many years under a future president whether it's republican or democrat so i think mitch mcconnell's getting what he wants out of this president and i don't see him um turning away from him especially not uh, when it comes to impeachment because you know trump has allowed mcconnell to carry on as he's wanted to for a long time and i think that's uh, McConnell's going to repay the favor. Yeah, I think you're right. I absolutely think there is no line Trump can cross that would ignite uh, widespread opposition 
uh, if from Mitch McConnell, the only thing would be if that 51% that you just alluded to, and that's a Fox poll, a yeah. uh, 51% in the Fox poll said they favor impeachment of the president. If that grows to over 60%, let's say, yeah. then it's political survival at stake. But you're absolutely correct when it comes to these issues. And this is where the Republican Party has lost all credibility. Uh, Miles, I talk about this just in terms of their attitude toward corruption. I have a lot of fun with this. Uh, every day, Dennis does an update on Marty Sandoval, state senator <laughs> from the southwest side, who's yeah. up to his eyeballs in federal investigations. Well, I mean, it might result in us getting rid of the red light cameras, it sounds that like. That is correct, <laughs> Senator. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, thank you, Robert Mueller. Uh, and uh, yeah, correct. That, they might get rid of red uh, light cameras. Across the state. Across the state. It's unbelievable. That's wild. Uh, and uh, I saw a Republican a senator, I think it was, a speak out on, on the issue. I can't remember which one or Republican rep representative, but it was true saying these red light cameras are not a deterrent. Uh, they, they are not, a, they're not, uh, improving safety. Uh, no, if they're anything, just, they're causing the rear end collisions. Rear end collision. It's just about shaking people down for money. And it's and the uh, poorest people in the, certainly when it comes to Chicago. I mean, that's one. Chewy Garcia ran on that in 2015. If you remember yes. so, taking down those red light cameras. Yes, so. he did. It didn't do him uh, much good, uh, <laughs> but he did run in that. But the point is, is that, uh, so the Republicans speak with such uh, passion about, uh, Marty Sandoval and his corruption, but they look the other way with Donald Trump. But what I'm saying is, is that they've lost credibility because almost on every issue that Republicans supposedly believe in, uh, Donald Trump has violated the central principles. You talk about balanced budgets, the budget's way out of whack. Uh, you talk about supporting Kurds uh, who've stood with us during the last 15 years. Uh, he just betrayed them. And so, but there's never any accountability by Republicans toward Trump. And so I think that uh, it's not any one issue uh, that will uh, turn Mitch McConnell against Donald Trump. It'll be if they sense that the country as a whole is finally uh, turning against him. Yeah, and I, I don't think that they have any um, warm feelings towards Donald Trump. A lot of these people hate Donald Trump. Donald Trump has undressed them publicly, you know, in so many different spaces, and yet he holds the power, he holds the key, and he's been able to um, redirect the um, party in his vision. I mean, I don't think that, if you remember, after Mitt Romney lost, the Republicans uh, had a summit and talked about how they needed to do outreach to Latin American communities, you know, in the United States. Donald Trump threw that whole playbook out the window and said, we're just going to attack mm. uh, immigrants. That's We're going to make that our primary issues, build a wall. The uh, that was Donald Trump being able to kind of build off of this very xenophobic populist energy that was out there and use it to his advantage electorally, very cynically. I mean, obviously that's created a big divide, but that's the way that Donald Trump has been able to impact the party as a whole. I don't think they have any allegiance to him personally, but they do have allegiance to power and to being able to be in these positions. So I could see them abandoning Trump if, it be if he becomes politically toxic, but that's, I mean, the, the the thing that's politically toxic, I think, is his policies that have devastated uh, working America. And I think that's the real thing that needs to be hammered home by Democrats, especially the, runs, the ones run, uh, running for president, is how much Trump ran on promising people, I'm going to get everybody health care, I'm going to bring back the jobs, all these things. Look, we, you know, we, we have the highest inequality in 50 years. That means that the very people that are voting in this country are the ones suffering because mm -hmm. the economy that uh, Trump has helped to prop up, especially through things like his tax cut for billionaires and corporations. So I think those are the kind of things that are going to be uh, more helpful electorally for people running against Trump and Trumpism. All right, let's take a, let's move toward local politics. I teased this earlier. Let's get down to it. The teacher strike. The, yeah. uh, it's not an actual strike yet, but uh, I think uh, a week from today. A week from today, it does not look good uh, at the moment. Uh, Miles for a settlement. I hope I'm wrong. I hope that uh, that a concession would be made by Lori Lightfoot on the issue of hiring, which seems to be uh, in class size seems to be the real to. Uh, uh, sticking points here. Uh, like I said, not a lot of open support for the teachers uh, in the media of Chicago. No. You, you just don't hear it. No. And Chicago, of course, is a union town. Chicago is a, uh, a liberal town, at least the way it votes. Uh, it's a democratic town. What's going on here? Well, this mayor has uh, come into office and I think did have quite a bit of support as we saw she you know basically ran the table electorally when the, in the second round of voting um, against Tony Freckwinkle and 
I think that what the Chicago Teachers Union is attempting to do is to finally make a headway, not just fight defensively, which is, if you remember during the last teacher strike in 2012, Rahm Emanuel was trying to extend the school day and then not compensate teachers for it. He also, you know, there was all kinds of uh, ways in which he was trying to punish teachers of, uh, effectively. And he was saying, F you Lewis, you know, he had this very confrontational approach with the teachers union and decided to make that a big effort of his uh, early on in his administration. Lori Lightfoot has not approached it the same way. You know, she has not been as outwardly confrontational. Um, that said, she is still running, you know, she's still using Rahm Emanuel's bargaining team of lawyers that were under operating under his administration to bargain uh, at the table for hers. She also is refusing to bargain over any other issues besides basically pay and um, and health benefits and so, some of the other issues. She also worked to get Cullerton to stall the bills for an elected school board um, and to change the law so that teachers, you, Chicago is the only area where teachers are only allowed to um, bargain over those very singular items. And that was done purposefully to restrict their ability to actually affect change. And what Janice Jackson is saying, you know, the... Uh, um, she, the CEO, she says that we need to uh, work to uh, provide flexibility for the administration. Uh, we know what that means. We've seen that every time. They say they're going to put it in a budget. They say they promised 200 new staff, that it's going to cost $10 million. Well, if that's not in a contract proposal, if that's not in writing, there's no way to hold the administration to account for it. And when Janice Jackson says we got to provide flexibility, we know what that means. That's going to go right out the window. So I think that it's, it's very clear the dynamic that's going on right now. The administration is still uh, stonewalling and saying what, we, what they're doing now, I find very cynical, is they're saying the union hasn't provided any real counter proposal. Well, that's because the only thing that the uh, administration has proposed is on these very specific uh, areas that the teachers aren't, you know, they're not mad about the 16% pay increase necessarily over five years, you know, they you know, would demand more, but the areas that they're really pushing on, the administration hasn't put forward any proposals, mm -hmm. whether it's class size, whether it's, you know, school nurses and librarians, social workers, um, this, you know, working to get the, the better good for the entire city of Chicago, not just for teachers, mm -hmm. but for students and create better learning conditions as well. So I think until uh, the mayor starts to, you know, change her tune and direct her bargaining team to address these concerns that, you know, hey, I think the public understands that these are critical things that there shouldn't be, um, you know, every the classrooms should not 25% of classrooms should not be overcrowded, which is the, the case now, according to new numbers that are put out. Um, and we should have librarians and social workers and nurses in schools. That should be a basic element of public education in the city. That's not asking too much. That's not being greedy. That's wanting a better life for our students. And I think that that is not coming through in a lot of the um, media portrayals of this because they're focusing also very singularly on the on pay and saying, hey, you got a good deal in terms of pay. Why don't you take the deal and go? Well, that's not what the Chicago Teachers Union is fighting for right yeah. now. They're fighting for a very different vision for what they say the, the school should Chicago's children deserve, and I think the public gets that more than the media class does. Well, we'll see. Uh, we'll see that uh, we will definitely see where the public is in this, yep. uh, and uh, uh, and I'm hoping they can reach a deal. I hope that uh, some kind of uh, the, the mayor will come forth on those issues of hiring people. She hasn't moved at all on that nope. one. Uh, she knows she's got the, the union there because uh, it's against the law for the union to strike. I had Stacey Davis Gates on the show on Monday, and I go, you ready to go to jail? Because mm -hmm. uh, if it comes to it, they could take their lawyers to court. Speaking of lawyers in court, Pat Quinn, former governor, is in the studio. We're going to bring him on. We may throw a teacher's union, a teacher question at him, see what he has to say. Pat Quinn has been in a few union negotiations in his time mm -hmm. as uh, governor of the state of Illinois. So Miles Comp Lasser from In These Times, thank you very much. Yeah. I just want to uh, give a plug. We're going to be doing a lot of coverage, as, assuming, you know, uh, ahead of this strike. And if the strike does uh, take place at InTheseTimes.com. So look out for that. We've got some great journalists, Rebecca Burns, Carrie Leiterson, other folks that are going to be contributing. So um, so check that out and stay tuned at In These Times for updates on um, the strike and more context and, and, and analysis. Very good. Thank you very much, Miles. Uh, Governor Quinn on deck. We'll bring him on when we return. Did you know that 40% of the people in Illinois opt to be cremated? Well, it's true. And Chicagoland Cremation Options honors their wishes by providing cremation services directly to the general public. 
Chicagoland Cremation Options provides an affordable, ethical, and easy cremation arrangement, whether in person or online. Save thousands and streamline the process by going directly to Chicagoland Cremation Options. It's a family-owned business operated by my good friend, Douglas Klein. Here's how you reach them. Chicagoland Cremation Options. Options.com. One more time. Chicago Land Cremation Options.com. Read the Chicago Reader to get up to speed on what's what in Chicago. Culture, food, arts and entertainment, weekly concert listings, weekly event listings, the environment, travel. I can continue, but you get the point. And for all of you Chicago political junkies, raw weekly columns on real city politics. From Maya Dukmasova and our very own Ben Jarofsky. The Chicago Reader, free to the public in newsstands throughout the city and online at chicagoreader.com. Read it now and be a more informed Chicagoan. Attention Chicago innovators and creators, 2019 Chicago Ideas Week is coming soon. October 12th through the 17th, this annual Ideas Festival is back, and it's the largest, most affordable Ideas Festival of its kind. They bring in hundreds of thought leaders from around the globe and some local to share ideas and spark action all across Chicago. To get a better idea of what to expect, here's a bit of audio from last year's Chicago Ideas Week with special guest and Chicago comedian Cameron Esposito. Everything that I have ever tried to do has had two motivations. One is I really do believe in trying to create social change. And then the other one is I'm scared and alone too. So I would like for you to join me. You know, every job that I have, I try to make sure to hold the door open. That's like my uh, motto for, for um, like if I get through, you're coming with me. And I really, I believe in that wholeheartedly. And uh, especially if I have more privilege than you, like I'm holding the door open for you um, even wider. October 12th through the 17th, it's 2019 Chicago Ideas Week. Tickets go on sale to members on August 22nd and to general public September 10th. Once again, if you're an innovator or creator in the city of Chicago or even outside the city, you must join us for Chicago Ideas Week, October 12th through the 17th. For tickets and event information, head to chicagoideas.com. That's chicagoideas.com. And we hope to see you October 12th through the 17th for 2019 Chicago Ideas Week. Today's Ben Jarofsky Show was brought to you in part by Chicago Architecture Center. Discover the breadth and majesty of Chicago's architecture on a Chicago Architecture Center bus tour. From bungalows to Bauhaus, our expert docents will share the fascinating stories behind our city's architecture. Book your tour at architecture.org slash tours. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm actually on a bus tour right now. Oh my, look at that wonderful piece of architecture. Get a special discount for Illinois residents from July 15th to August 15th. All Illinois residents get 50% off select walking tours. Visit architecture.org slash IL dash resident. All right, everybody. Hour number two of your Ben Jarofsky show is moments away. We got Pat Quinn in studio looking sharp. Looking Him and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a tie, he took it up. Still looking sharp. Though. He's still looking. He's the sharpest looking guy in this studio, uh, that's for sure. If only you were <laughs> here yesterday. Cup. Yeah, he had a tie yesterday. I was looking sharp yeah. yesterday. Yeah. Uh, no, oh, no. no, no. <laughs> a tie with a flannel shirt. Yeah. No, he, come on. He's from Alton, but he knows how to all dress, right, I, all right? He lived in Madison County. I know where Alton is. Uh, right on the river. But hour number two is moments away here. Uh, but before we do that, we got to thank the following unions for jumping on board and sponsoring our program. First up, it's the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local 126 and District 8, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150, and, of course, today's show is brought to you by our good friends at the Chicago Federation of Labor. Hour number two, let's go. It is Thursday, October 10th, and live from the Chicago Sun-Times Chicago Reader Studio on Racine Avenue, this is the Ben Jarofsky Show. In this hour of the program, Former Illinois Governor Pat Quinn is here, and we're talking all things property taxes. Get your notes and pens ready with property tax guru Andrea Rayla. 
And now your host, I'd say property tax guru. <laughs> Not like Andrea Rayla or Pat Quinn for that matter. Chicago Reader columnist Ben Jaroski. Pat Quinn sitting here. He came with a gift. This is a column that I wrote in 2016. Pat brought back memories when you, you gave it to me. I met with you. You were... Uh, it was two years out of office, and we were at a, the Yoke, you said, Yoke, a restaurant. At, nice uh, restaurant. Nice I'm restaurant. Wells. Yeah. I'm Wells. And uh, you were trying to convince me to do something I thought I would never do, support term limits. And you broke down my resistance. Uh, and uh, so here's the part I like. The, uh, after we had this long discussion, you were citing the founding fathers, et cetera, and so <laughs> forth. Uh, and so I write, with the thought of the school cuts and tiffs on my mind, I signed his a ballot. Uh, I signed his petition. Quinn aide Elizabeth Norton and a waiter looked on as witnesses <laughs> just in case Mayor Rahm's election lawyers should challenge my signature at some future uh, election board hearing. That was in 2016. Here we are three years later. This case is still going on. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about the Millennium Park case uh, that you were well, in court it's today. Related. Well, well, it's, it's related. It's related. Let's yeah. start uh, with this, this. I've just considered it an outrage <laughs> of anti-democracy in the city of Chicago, the state of Illinois. Uh, just update everybody, Pat. Okay, well, of the big cities in America, the 10 largest, nine out of 10 have term limits on their mayor. Mm -hmm. Chicago was the only exception. New York, Los Angeles, they all have term limits on their mayor of two terms usually. That's what we were trying to get when Emanuel was in office. He was strenuously against it. He did everything he could, including having uh, gum shoes at uh, Millennium Park to uh, get in the way of our petition passers and try to harass them and uh, deny them a chance to get signatures, including Elizabeth Norton, who was one of the petition passers. So basically, despite all that, we got the signatures. In fact, the mayor had an armada of uh, <laughs> challengers to try and knock us off the ballot. We needed 52,000 to get it on the November ballot last year. And we got uh, over 88,000. And uh, despite their efforts, uh, whether it was everything they tried, uh, we won. We had enough signatures, and we got that uh, announced uh, the Thursday before Labor Day of 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, the Tuesday after Labor Day, His Honor the Mayor announced after much reflection that he wasn't going to run for a third term. Mm -hmm. So I know for a fact that uh, our petition drive had a, an impact on mm -hmm. that because it was... Now, they still kept challenging it, trying to keep it off the ballot. Uh, we went through the circuit court. We went to the appellate court. We petitioned to the Supreme Court. Um, and the actual question was voted on by the voters in November yeah. of last year. Uh, people voted, I think, overwhelmingly for it. But the Board of Elections won't release the results of the actual referendum. And so we may have to go to court for that. And basically, uh, in the election for the new mayor... Of the 15 candidates running in the first round, 14 out of 15 were for term limits on the mayor. The only exception was Tony Preckwinkle. Uh, Lori Lightfoot was for a two-year term limit or two-term limit on the mayor. So, in a lot of ways, uh, the people won with this. And um, one of the sidebars of this is, while he was still mayor, Mayor Emanuel's commissioner of uh, cultural affairs promulgated rules about Millennium Park. And it said you can't disrupt uh, people uh, and you can't gather signatures in, on petitions with clipboards uh, in the park. They divided the park into 11 rooms. And they said in only one room can you gather signatures. Uh, everywhere else is off limits, including the Great Lawn, where people wait before the movie or the music begins. That's where we got most of the names. So we feel that that's unconstitutional. And this morning I was in court saying that the rules that the mayor's commissar of cultural affairs promulgated are quite similar to the rules that they have for Tiananmen Square in uh, Beijing. Mm -hmm. That if you were running around trying to term limit uh, President uh, Z or G or whatever his name is in China, you would be arrested. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what Chicago's rules are all about. We think they're unconstitutional, um, especially nowadays when you see the NBA. One fellow says... Uh, uh, stand up for Hong Kong. Uh, we believe in freedom. Next thing you know, China thinks that they want to impose their values on us. Yeah. No way. So we believe in the First Amendment, the right to petition, 
and uh, Elizabeth Norton is one of our plaintiffs in uh, federal court. And the bottom line is we want to be able to go to the park, uh, to the mu oh, Great Lawn before the music starts, before the film starts, and gather signatures. All right, well, let's break this down. Uh, by the way, the, uh, Pat, Pat was alluding to Daryl Morey, who is the general manager of Houston Rockets, tweeted out support for the protesters at Hong Kong. Uh, and then just in the, the, in the storm that followed, he re uh, retracted his tweet. Uh, the NBA was very concerned that uh, China would start uh, boycotting NBA, uh, not allow them to play games there, pull back on endorsement deals, etc. They took two, two games off TV immediately. Immediately, but they're playing those games. I believe the games are actually being, but whatever. Uh, so that's what uh, Pat's alluding to. There's there's limits to free expression, uh, and that's the heart of what happened with uh, the NBA in China. And it's also at the heart of what you're fighting here in Millennium Park. So let me just break this down a little bit. So you said the it's so it's an a mayor, an appointee of Mayor Rahm in the chart in the department of, uh, did you say, what did Cultural you say? Affairs. Cultural affairs promulgated a rule. So in other words, this was not a rule adopted by the city council and put into uh, the Chicago code, mm -hmm. the municipal code. This was just a rule that one official who was appointed by the mayor promulgated and the, so that the uh, security guards who uh, operate in Millennia Park were following it a, an, an order, like an order that says you have to wear a hat or you have to wear a tie. or you, In other words, they, so they were just, this is not a law, if you will. Is no, that correct? No, as a matter of fact, these uh, security types, gumshoes, would go to our uh, <laughs> petition passers and say, yeah. you're trespassing. One fella had a clipboard and uh, he said, well, you can't come in the park with a clipboard. And says who? You know, well, these are the rules. They were promulgated in April uh, by the mayor's commissar. And it turns out, where do you think the mayor was sworn in in 2011, Ben? I happen Millennium, to be there. You were there at Millennium I was there. Park. There's a, a YouTube of me standing up. It's, yeah. You know, uh, the assembled multitude in Millennium Park at the Great Lawn, the Pritzker Pavilion, the mayor giving his speech. Okay, bless his heart. But the bottom line is you can't say the mayor is okay to speak here in the park, but those, uh, you know, uh, petition passers, those uh, young men and women who are trying to get signatures on a clipboard, oh, no, you got to go. You're, you'll be arrested in, for trespassing if you stay here. Now, this is a lawsuit that is not directly related uh, to your passing petitions for term limits. Am I correct? Well, the event occurred while they were passing petitions for term limits. Uh, and so those are the facts, and they intend to continue passing petitions to put referendums on the Chicago ballot or the Cook County ballot. You know, it's important that these fundamental rights be protected. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been passing petitions for quite a while, uh, 40 plus years, and uh, we've won cases uh, back in the 80s uh, where both the federal and state courts said petition passing in Illinois, mm -hmm. land of Lincoln, is a fundamental right. And it is subject to strict scrutiny by the courts whenever bureaucrats or mayors try to interfere with this fundamental right. So, so are you the plaintiff in a lawsuit against the city of Chicago? I'm the lawyer for four petition passers, good and true. Uh, they all have a little separate... Uh, stories. Uh, if you recall, when President Obama came to Chicago right before he left office, this was in January of 2017, I, I was there at, uh, out there at Mac McCormick Place, he said, you know, we're not happy about Trump, uh, but don't go on the internet and just complain. He said, get a clipboard, uh, get petitions, get signatures. I, my friends are all looking at me when they <laughs> said that. We were sitting there. Yeah. And so that's what we're doing. Yeah. And we're not going to let uh, Emmanuel or any of these uh, operatives uh, take away that fundamental right. Now, is the city of Chicago, do they have lawyers in court fighting you? They do. And I actually went to two, you know, the two today and I said, gee, why are you doing this? You know, why don't you settle the matter? I mean, uh, we're, we're not interfering with somebody watching a TV or mo a film or listening to the music. We left after the, the music began or the film began. Uh, but beforehand, people would be sitting there having picnics or just waiting for stuff to start, generally between five o'clock and 630. And so there's no disruption whatsoever. And the idea that we're disrupting is really a figment of their imagination. A lot of people might say that uh, some of the things that the uh, city hall does disrupts things. But, uh, you know, we live in a democracy. Not uh, We are not in China and, and Tiananmen Square.
And what did, was the, when you said this to the lawyer, what was their response? Uh, we, we only operate according to orders. So basically... <laughs> following orders? Yeah, following orders. Okay. Aye, aye, sir. Um, <laughs> so really, I, yeah. the, our current mayor, a new person who does support term limits, she campaigned yeah. on it, as a matter of fact, a two-term uh, two limit, four-year terms, uh, that would be two of them, that's what the president has. Lori Lightfoot campaign on that. And I would think that um, she, as a former U.S. attorney, would be quite sensitive to these First Amendment rights, these rights to uh, speak and to assemble and to circulate petitions on causes, uh, especially if they're binding referendums that deal with reforming city government. So um, I think the Corporation Council, the new one of uh, the city, needs to take a hard look at this on behalf of the mayor because they're really on thin ice. And it's embarrassing. And now this is the first round, correct? Am I, or is this already an appeal? Well, well, no, no. We're in district federal court. First round. The judge uh, accelerated the case. The hearing will be on November 7th. Uh, we have to provide some of the legal documents and such uh, and uh, need depositions. But we have four men and women uh, who are involved in our petition drive who are plaintiffs. Uh, William Morgan and Tyler Brumfield, Doris Davenport and uh, uh, Elizabeth Norton. And they all had separate uh, encounters with the gumshoes. Mm -hmm. who t one, of, one of them told uh, Elizabeth that she was a terrible person. And, te and Elizabeth said, well, I'm d doing this with Pat Quinn. And, he, and the fellow said, well, he's a terrible person, too. Oh <laughs> so I can take uh, <laughs> criticism, uh, but I don't uh, won't, uh, you know, tolerate uh, people circulating petitions in the best traditions of American democracy. Well, being it's, hassled. In it, it's interesting that uh, you, you just uh, quoted a uh, little while ago, President Obama. Uh, in, tar in terms of saying, just, just don't sit there and uh, tweet, uh, mm -hmm. get out there, pass petitions and uh, run for office, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, I am making a guess here, maybe I'm wrong on this one, I'll ask you, get your opinion, that had you been circulating pit petitions uh, denouncing Donald John Trump, they may have let you uh, circulate those petitions, but you were in fact, were circulating petitions that were endangering the political career of the boss, Mayor Rahm Emanuel. And got so- ins Got inaugurated at a very place. The, and, I never said there speech. was consistency in the part of uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel on anything. Uh, <laughs> so I, I will uh, admit that there's inconsistent uh, principles there, uh, but my problem is, so let's just talk, deal with that. Do you think you would have been hassled had you been uh, gathering signatures denouncing Donald John Trump? Well, I, I think that it would be wrong to uh, harm anyone circulating petitions, whatever the cause, because that's another principle of law. You cannot attack somebody who is passing petitions or speaking based on the content, you know, whether it's for a manual or against a manual or anybody else, uh, you cannot have content based discrimination. If the mayor can go to Millennium Park and make a speech and tell the world what he thinks, that's fine. But so can a humble person with a clipboard uh, who believes in term limits for the mayor of Chicago, just like they have term limits for the mayor of New York and Los Angeles and Houston and everywhere else, they can't muffle or muzzle that person. And uh, this is a principle I feel very strongly about, and we're going to uh, contend in court and win this battle. Uh, you know, we've won other ones on petition rights, and we're going to hopefully win this one. Well, I'll be following this one because I, I remember Millennium Park uh, opened back in the O's, I went 04, 05, whenever that was. And uh, the, at the time, Mayor Daley uh, was very vigilant about uh, limiting what people could do in Millennium Park. And one of the things that they were strong about following this, Pat, was they did not want photographers taking pictures of, like, the bean, uh, you know, the tourist attraction. And they would, these gumshoes, as you call them, uh, would go up to photographers and say, you cannot take a, a picture. Uh, then the issue got into whether the city has well, uh, the right to regulate what people do in a public place, and they were and they were arguing that that they do. And I I presume you're going to face that same argument yeah. uh, in court. Yeah, there's something. Uh, you can have reasonable restrictions. For example, if a film is going on, you can say, well, you can't disrupt people watching the film. That's called time, manner, and place. But if the film is not going on and people are just sitting there waiting, uh, they're in a park. And the parks traditionally are a public forum. 
Sidewalks and parks are the essence of American democracy. And so First Amendment and democracy to really be canceled out and censored by government bureaucrats. And that's kind of what's happened here. And um, we're going to, you know, hopefully uh, vindicate the rights of the people who are circulating the petition and establish, you know, what the bounds are for democracy in Millennium Park and everywhere else. By the way, what is the status of the, uh, the term limit lawsuit itself? Well, we filed a petition to the Supreme Court. It's called Petition for Leave to Appeal, which they denied. And I'm very disappointed in that uh, decision of the Supreme Court. We know that people voted last November uh, on this subject, uh, but uh, and we still haven't seen the results. The City Board of Elections won't release the results. So I think our next step is to probably use the Freedom of Information Act to try to get the actual results of the referendum, submit them to uh, Mayor Lightfoot, and say the people are for this, you're for this, let's put it on the ballot, you can have the city council and the mayor do it if you wish, and let's get this thing resolved. So mm. to me, that's the ultimate outcome. I think they could probably pass it by a city council vote. No, you must have a referendum. Okay. The voters you know, I must out of your wisdom yeah. on this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not gonna argue with yeah. Pat Quinn on the law on this the, one. <laughs> the city council can, by resolution, put it on the ballot. Very good point, yeah. yeah that, and they we're could've... for that, you know, that'll be the best way to show what the people voted last uh, February in April when the new mayor was elected, there are four term limits. All the candidates said there are four term limits and everybody else has them and the president has them. And, uh, you know, I think we need to get them. Now, do you have any feeling like uh, a paranoia that the election results have been destroyed or do you think they've been preserved? Well, I w the, the judge actually ordered that they be preserved. I uh, wasn't too happy with the way the Sh Chicago Board of Elections handled even the petition challenge. They were ruling out people who printed their name under the law, whatever you use to sign your name, whether it's a printed signature or a cursive signature, it's okay. Yeah. And we had 8,700 people uh, have their signatures disqualified because of printing. Yeah. And so um, we got to watch them, but I, I do believe the results are there. That's why we, we, the Freedom of Information Act allows you to force a government bureaucracy to disgorge and reveal their records. But there is a standing judicial order uh, compelling the Board of Election Commissioners to preserve those election mm -hmm. results? That was in the court uh, case uh, back in uh, maybe September. Of and they've year. not gone, the Board of Elections has not gone to court to undo that? They told us all along that they still had everything preserved. The Freedom of Information Act would allow us to show that to the public. I know for a fact the uh, term limits will pass by 70, 80 percent. I've you know? never understood the argument for not revealing the result. I mean, mm. the, you, you could set, you could go to court to argue that the result is not binding and that mm -hmm. uh, uh, Pat Quinn and his circulators did not have the right to get this on the ballot for whatever reason. And apparently the, the judges and in their infinite wisdom have decided that is the case. But that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you can't let people see what the result was. Well, Those yeah. are two separate issues, are see, they not? Exactly right. And what happened was, you know, the city council at the mayor's behest put three questions, uh, advisory questions on the ballot to try and keep us off. And that was the nub of the court case. So the bottom line is the records exist showing how people feel about term limits for the mayor. Why not uh, let the people see that? Because mm -hmm. uh, it's their government. And so, you know, there's always going to be a fight for democracy, uh, Ben. And that's what referendums and petition and uh, getting involved, knocking on doors is all about. And I really admire anybody who does it, whatever their cause. All right. Uh, it's sort of Pat Quinn Day on the Ben Jarofsky Show. Not only are you here, Andrea Rayla is here. <laughs> she, I, I met Andrea way back in the 80s. She was working for you. Yes, she was. Uh, and, she began uh, as an analyst, <laughs> uh, a heel <laughs> analyst, and Andrea has uh, is a force of nature <laughs> and uh, has been uh, yeah. exhibiting that to the world for the last, uh, I don't know, however She's a young looking uh, 50 something. No, she's very young looking. All right, before <laughs> we bring her on to take a deep dive into property taxes, she comes on once a month or so to give a, a little uh, seminars or sorts. I need to get your opinion on what Donald Trump is doing uh, in regards to the impeachment inquiry by uh, the Democrats in Congress. As you know, I know you follow these things as well, closely as I do, Pat. Uh, he has asserted that he will not comply with subpoenas, congressional subpoenas. He will not turn over documents. 
documents. He will not turn over records. He will not, he will order, I don't know how he could do this. He will order people who work for him not to show up and testify. Your thoughts? Yeah. Well, there's a fundamental principle of law. He actually went to Northwestern Law School and became a lawyer some years ago. You can't be the judge of your own case to do. The Constitution is crystal clear. The power to impeach lies with the uh, Congress, not with the president. And so he can't set rules or uh, sort of resist uh, what the Congress wants in order to carry out Im its impeachment. Keep in mind, impeachment is just sending the case over to the Senate. The House impeaches. The Senate then has a trial and will decide whether to convict him or not. If you remember with uh, Bogoyevich, he was impeached by the Illinois House. Then it went to the Senate. I know the date, January 29th, 2009. The Senate of Illinois had a trial, and by a 59 to nothing vote, voted to convict Blagojevich of the articles of impeachment that he was accused of. And so on that very day, that's when I got sworn in. Yeah. And so with respect to Trump, he should abide by the Constitution. The Congress, a separate branch of government, has the power of impeachment, and he has to respect that. I would uh, point out a great distinction between uh, the Blagojevich impeachment uh, and what's going on in Congress, uh, the Democrats, Rod Bogoyevich, for folks who forgot, was a Democrat. He was a Democratic governor. Before that, he was a Democratic congressman. Before that, he was a Democratic state rep. The Democrats uh, in the State House and the General Assembly and uh, in the Senate and the House of Representatives did not stand up as one to declare that uh, Rob Bogoyevich was above the law, and they, they were not—they were going—they were not acting as his defenders. In fact, the loudest accusers that he had were Democrats. Although for ten trivia points back when, there was one Democrat. What say Ken, Ken Duncan? Wasn't it? No, oh. <laughs> you're mixing up Ken. Oh, <laughs> that's funny. Ken Duncan did not break from the Democratic Party until the Rauner years. I uh, he didn't vote yes on impeachment. There was one Democratic legislator. Uh, was that Smith? No. no. And uh, I believe his, I, you know, I've just, Coleman? Was that his name? Uh, it was, or I can't remember. Now I forgot his name. I gave you the trivia question and I forgot it. There was one and he was from the South Side, but it was definitely not Ken Duncan. I can tell you okay. that for any. But anyway, that was in the House in terms of the articles. Of it. Wait, no. I, I see you're correct. The dead Deb Mel may have been in the House of Representatives yeah, at the time. Vote. And she probably did not vote at all, if unless she voted, because that's her brother-in-law. Yeah, I think um, she voted no. She voted no? Yeah. All right, anyway. There's so there two we or go. three votes maybe in the House, unanimous in the Senate. But it's a serious matter. Mm -hmm. And I remember those days, you know, keep in mind the American economy was in a ditch falling apart, you know, back in 09, January vote at the time. And then the state budget was hopeless. And then we had this ethics crisis with Bogoyevich. We were an international laughing stock. So they acted uh, prudently and uh, judiciously. And, you know, I had to navigate through that. I remember going to the governor's mansion that very day and uh, getting a call from Chrysler, which has a huge plant in Belvedere, saying we're closing uh, very shortly. 200, you know, they had 4,000 plus jobs. But fortunately, we rode to the rescue and I worked with the president. We Kept Chrysler alive, Ford alive, everybody else to you know, get to a better day. It was dark days indeed. What's your sense of how this is going to get resolved uh, in Washington, the showdown between I Trump happen and to Congress. read the New York Times editorial today and in the column. It could be that the Supreme Court has to break this uh, kind of gridlock between the legislative branch, Congress, the House in particular, and the president. And uh, that has to be expeditious. In other words, they can't allow a part of our Constitution that gives the Congress, the House, the power to impeach, uh, to have that taken away by a president who's judge of his own case. It, it's not acceptable. All right, very good. Pat Quinn in the studio. Andrea Rela is on deck. We're going to bring her on. Pat, thanks for mu okay. so much for coming on. It's a blast. Good to see you there, Ben. I hope we can get to the playoffs with the Bulls this oh. year. Oh, you know, give it. Oh, you, you were at yeah, you were uh, at the game last night. I was. Yes, uh, indeed. And your analysis of my beloved Chicago Bulls, a, a Grand well, Park celebration for the championship this year. Well, I would hope so. <laughs> uh, if the, if the rules of of Millennium Park allow it, uh, we would like to be there. Yeah, yeah. but uh, no. Uh, I would say Coach Boylan, uh, who I got to know a little bit, uh, believes in defense, and you win championships with defense. Yeah. And so they got to be a little bit better on defense. But Levine is a good guy to watch, marketing, and uh, the 
Bernard, the guy yeah. Saransky or something, he looked yeah, pretty Thomas good. Saransky. And I also like Otto Porter, a graduate of a great school called Georgetown. Georgetown, okay. Yeah, a very good team player, so look forward to uh, more than 40 Well, not to disagree wins. with Pat Quinn on anything, but that defense needs a little help. 41 or 43 points in the fourth quarter, 127 points overall. I need. I think my beloved yeah. Bulls need to work on that defense a little bit. I agree with that, but they did have the third string in, so we'll see. All right, very All right, good, good point. That's Pat Quinn. Uh, Andrea Rail is on deck. We'll bring her on when we return. It's the butter cow, which has nine hearts to represent the nine essential nutrients in milk. That's right. It's made entirely out of butter. And, it, you know, it's a state fair tradition since at least 1922. But what I can tell you is that I will work tirelessly to ensure whatever options we take will be made with transparency and with working folks in mind. We are committed to a graduated real estate transfer tax. This will bring relief to homeowners whose houses sell for under $500,000, while owners with higher valued homes will pay more of their fair share. We are committed to addressing homelessness and housing instability and putting real resources towards these problems. We are exploring options to address rampant congestion that solves the problem of traffic, pollution, and other issues while simultaneously bringing in a fair share of funding. And we are working to develop a policy to stand up a robust cannabis industry, one that will not only generate revenue for the city, but creates new business and job opportunities for black and brown people who have been the victims of the war on drugs and who to date have been mostly excluded from legitimate medical and recreational markets as entrepreneurs. It's Chicagoland's adult entertainment playground. It's the world famous Admiral Theater, 3940 West Lawrence Avenue. The Admiral is homegrown from Chicago and it's the most conveniently located club in all of the city. 15 minutes from the O'Hare Airport in downtown Chicago Loop. Voted Chicago's best strip club, the Admiral has showgirls galore and a variety of adult entertainment shows. The world famous Admiral Theater, open every day from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. 3940 West Lawrence Avenue. For events, showtime, and other information, visit AdmiralX.com. Must be 18 years of age or older to enter. I'm here with former Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel, Chief of Staff to President Obama, somebody that knows Joe Biden very well. Give us uh, your rating of his performance so far, Rahm. Well, I think uh, Joe Biden brought energy. That was his first, uh, I think, hurdle he had to clear. He brought passion uh, to this effort. And I also more, I was a Esther Tibeto, the way he handled, obviously, what happened in El Paso. So on that level, he is engaged. And I also think he did something very smart. On health care, he made Bernie his foil, not Elizabeth Warren, which was smart uh, in that effort, uh, in that time. I also got to say this. I thought Amy, uh, Kamala, and uh, Beto all had their moments. I, I, I think the person that got hurt so far is Castro. He looked mean. He looked petty, some people were saying on Twitter. But we oh, I didn't see, see that. there's yeah, still about... Attention Chicago innovators and creators, 2019 Chicago Ideas Week is coming soon. October 12th through the 17th, this annual Ideas Festival is back, and it's the largest, most affordable Ideas Festival of its kind. They bring in hundreds of thought leaders from around the globe and some local to share ideas and spark action all across Chicago. To get a better idea of what to expect, here's a bit of audio from last year's Chicago Ideas Week with special guest and Chicago comedian Cameron Esposito. Everything that I have ever tried to do has had two motivations. One is I really do believe in trying to create social change. And then the other one is I'm scared and alone too. So I would like for you to join me. You know, every job that I have, I try to make sure to hold the door open. That's like my uh, motto for, for um, like if I get through, you're coming with me. And I really, I believe in that wholeheartedly. And uh, especially if I have more privilege than you, like I'm holding the door open for you um, even wider. October 12th through the 17th, it's 2019 Chicago Ideas Week. 
Tickets go on sale to members on August 22nd and to general public September 10th. Once again, if you're an innovator or creator in the city of Chicago or even outside the city, you must join us for Chicago Ideas Week, October 12th through the 17th. For tickets and event information, head to chicagoideas.com. That's chicagoideas.com. And we hope to see you October 12th through the 17th for 2019 Chicago Ideas Week. Welcome back to The Ben Jarofsky Show, live from the Chicago Sun-Times. Andrea Arela in the studio, property tax guru. Andrea Arela in the studio. As I said before, I met you uh, many years ago, back in the 80s, and uh, you've not aged at all. I, of course, have aged tremendously, as has Pat Quinn. Uh, and uh, just teasing him. Uh, and you were working for Pat Quinn. Uh, Forrest Claypool, I think, was somewhere on the payroll as well. Uh, and David Wilhelm. Wilhelm was there? Yeah. Brian Hamer, who was the 10 or 15 year revenue director. Yeah, I, I remember you and Claypool. I remember you mainly. Uh, and uh, I don't know why the others were in the back room. But I, were you guys there all at the same time working for Pat at the same time? That's when he was on the uh, Board of Review, correct? Uh, somehow or other, he got elected to that. I don't know how he got elected to that. And then years later, it's one of my favorite stories. Uh, Pat was out of office, he was in between jobs or whatever uh, elected office and he came before the um oh was it the board of review and uh, joe barrios was on that and wilson frost was on these are old time chicago democrats ladies and gentlemen the youngsters out there powerhouses uh in their ward joe barrios of course cook county assessor people have forgotten wilson frost finance chair 34th ward alderman and at this time he was on the board of review and you were arguing uh, I always love to tell Pat about this. Uh, you were representing some uh, taxpayer uh, who was questioning this, the valuation of the Sears Tower. And that, that notion being, follow me in this, everybody, if Sears Towers pays less than property taxes, you pay more because that's how our system works. Someone has to compensate for the breaks that uh, the Berrios and Frost and the assessor, I think it was Tully at the time, were giving Sears Tower. And the lawyer up again, do you remember who the lawyer was? It was Kevin O'Keefe, was his name? A good friend of Hillary Clinton. So it's, it's like the powers that be. And, and there was Pat Quinn and, and Andrea was like his assistant, like doing for Pat Quinn what she just did for me. She had a pile of papers and she was like giving him papers and he was arguing this case, and you lost. I hate to say so, uh, What are you going to do? Two to nothing was the score, as Pat said. Yeah, so anyway. But you're still fighting the fight, uh, Andrea. All right. Uh, the last time on your show, you were talking about floodplain gate, which we call floodplain gate. Uh, and uh, Mark Brown took up that crusade with the Chicago Sun-Times, wrote a couple of columns about it. And that is that people are in the northern suburbs, some of the wealthiest corners of Winnetka, I think it is, or Wilmette, are getting advantage of a break in their taxes because they live, quote unquote, I'm putting it in air quotes, on a floodplain. Is that correct? And uh, so... Yeah, that's about the gist of it. But the, the problem with it is that of the 1,126 homeowners, 600, 660 of them live in Winnetka, rarely have their basements even flooded because these are folks that w had to uh, go by the village regulations and put some pumps in or anything else, but they did not have flooding issues that were that severe to mandate that they get a redo on their triannual reassessment so that their $2 million home, which maybe started at at $1.9 million, it was reassessed, maybe it was reassessed at $1.8 million, a little down, then gets reassessed down to $1 million. So the floodplain flap was one that allowed a backdoor way in after you make the triannual soup and you serve it to the township mm -hmm. after they have an opportunity to complain for 30 days <laughs> the door shut and after four months the door opened up and the soup was remade with new ingredients and served out to another 1120 and they used the process called the certificate of correction process which is a very little known way that um, it's a statute that's poorly written um, but that allows the assessor to say, hey, I made a mistake on your house. The square footage is not 5,000 square feet. It's 2,000 square feet. Or, you know, I, 
I had a reduction in your assessment. It should have gone down to 200000 We actually made it 10000 mm-hmm. So they would go to the Board of Review and say, the doors are shut for this township. These are the errors. Correct them. You do about 10 to 40 of those a year. That's it. Mm-hmm. Never in the 30 years that I've been in this industry, never seen the certificate of correction used in this manner. So uh, the jury's still out because the board has to approve those. But what's interesting is the very areas that have the most severe flooding, which is Des Plaines in Main Township, where there's an area on Big Ben where 70 homes were bought by the FEMA group, the village, and torn down because of the flooding problems that they had. They did not get that type of relief when they got their triannual reassessments out at the same month that Nutrier. And their assessments came out. Their assessments went up 7, 8, 10%. No relief for floodplain issues. Mm-hmm. And the argument that the assessor said, the reason why they didn't get relief, there weren't enough of them. Mm. Well, well <coughs> you know, uh, as we're, one of the favorite themes we have here, uh, there's so much wrong with our property tax system. Uh, it's arbitrarily enforced. Uh, if you don't understand the, how the system works, you probably won't engage the system seeking exemptions and lowered uh, assessments. We'll get into that in a little while. And as a result, your taxes will be higher relative to somebody who does engage uh, in the system. And at the top of the list, and this is not your particular issue, but uh, it's at the heart of it, is that our funding for schools is dependent on the property tax system. And so as a result, there's an incentive for towns and cities, municipalities, uh, school districts to keep increasing the property tax because they need to get the money somehow to pay for schools. And uh, that's why Chicago is in this current crisis right now. One of the reasons is because uh, Mayor Lori Lori Lightfoot does not want to raise property taxes to finance the things that the Chicago Teachers Union uh, is seeking. So she'd rather do without them. And uh, there's no help coming from the feds. The state can't pick up all or uh, isn't doesn't have the resources to pick up all the needs. And so as a result, so much of the emphasis on the property tax system, Andrea, and that it puts us at such a disadvantage in my humble opinion in in the state of Illinois, because we're so dependent on this thing. Absolutely. You know, we collect $31 billion a year in property taxes. That's 50% more than all of the sale taxes and income taxes combined. 50% 50% more. So we are so over-reliant on these property taxes, and we've got to figure out a way. Now, having a graduated income tax, I'm okay with, but it's only going to bring us maybe $3.5 billion more. What is that going to do for property tax relief? Unless you give back a billion every year and give someone in a homeowner a $500 refund, I'm not sure that that's going to solve. It's a systemic change that we need to do. And that's why the governor put together this task force called the Property Tax Relief Task Force. And even the assessor is going out and advocating that we vote yes on the referendum and let's hear your problems that you're having about property taxes. So I appeared before the task force twice, Mm -hmm. and one of my last appearance was to talk about the floodplain and the certificate of of correction process and exemptions and how exemptions are not fairly um, given out. All right, let's talk about exemptions. Uh, Talk, uh, first of all, explain to people what exemptions are and what some of the exemptions that currently exist. We have a plethora of exemptions. We have nine exemptions. Some of them are only for Cook County because like the long-term exemption, the other 101 counties could have opted in to get that exemption, but they opted out. In any case, we have nine in Cook County. The primary one is the homeowner's exemption, and Chicago will give you about $692 off your tax bill. Then we have the senior exemption, which if you're 65 years old, regardless of your income level and how large your home is, you get another $350 off your bill. But then you can also apply for all of the other exemptions if you qualify. So believe it or not, Ben, there are some taxpayers that get four exemptions. I saw a taxpayer get five exemptions. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but when you apply them in certain ways, as our studies looked at and, and, and disclosed to the task force, you have the long-term exemption that many Chicagoans remember. There are about 250,000 
Cook County people who took care of the, took the long-term exemption. If you live in your house 10 years, you made $100,000 or less. It started out making 75000 or less, but they upped it. But if you lived there for 10 years, you made $100,000 or less, regardless of your age, you got an exemption. Um, and it was it's complicated to calculate, but it's based on an increase that you got in the past in your reassessment year. So that's been sunsetting, but we examined it, and then there's no er, there's no advocacy for the long term exemption on the on the assessor's website. It says it's dying out. There's only two percent of the people that actually get them. So I looked at them. I looked at all 2,261 homeowners that got this exemption, called the long-term exemption, mm-hmm. and they were predominantly on the north side, in in Winnetka, Barrington, in some areas of Chicago, and to the west. Not one single long-term exemption was given to the south suburbs, which really has some p- real problems with not only flood waters and, and water uh, issues, but being underwater, highest more highest uh, foreclosure and short sales in in the entire uh, county. Seventy five percent of all our tax delinquencies come out from that south suburban area. In any case, six point three million dollars in long term exemptions is spread out amongst two thousand two hundred and sixteen homeowners in those areas and some of those long-term exemptions give a value of like, like 29,000 15,000 in tax relief on tax bills of the most wealthiest homeowners along the lakefront and their tax bill that typically is 80,000 and 70,000 drops down to 50,000 No wait before we go for it long-term exemption requires uh, that you have lived in your home for how long? 10 years. 10 years. And d- is there an uh, income limit on it? Income limit is $100,000. So if you make more than $100,000, you cannot I get, you. get the long-term exemption. And they're sunsetting that? That's, they're they're that's... sunsetting, but they're going to bring it up in the Springfield session to talk about how to revive it and consider it a new type of exemption. But the problem with this exemption, Ben, is example there's something called the disability veterans exemption Mm -hmm. and if you're 70 percent disabled you don't have to pay property taxes anymore in 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 illinois we're only four states that have this terrific exemption for anybody that fought in a foreign war and if you're 30 or 40 percent disabled you get a, a, a an exemption too but you know, there's a handful of people that are not paying property tax bills, taking taking advantage of the 70% disability of a veteran. That is capped on if you own a home of any value, but capped at 850000 Now, I don't know too many vets that own an $850,000 home and that have 70% disability, but they capped it that way. With the senior citizen freeze and the long time exemption, there is no cap. You can own the Taj Mahal. <laughs> you, you can own a six million dollar home, and as long as you show that. All right. You, so wait, time out. As long finish that sentence. As long as you show that you're making less than a hundred thousand. Right. So how do you to prove? Let's okay. You're, so you're you're showing me uh, homes that are on the lakefront in the north suburbs that are benefiting from the long term exemption. Now those homes on the market would go for six seven million dollars. We're talking almost mansions. I'm looking at them. They look like I would call them mansions. They're right there on Lake uh, in the North Shore. And uh, if, you, if you put on the market six, seven million dollars, how could somebody who earns a hundred thousand dollars afford that house? Well, a lot of right now, the trend for mega mansions is not so great. They stay on the market more than two to 300 days. The wealthy are not buying them. More middle size, two hundred and seventy-five to five hundred thousand dollar homes are selling. But that being said, the people who have those homes now, many of them on the average have a fifty thousand to sixty thousand dollar tax bill. Some of them can pay that tax bill and not even get their exemptions. Don't even file for their exemptions because they don't they don't need the relief. Mm-hmm. But there are homeowners there who may be retired have purchased that home 10, 20 years ago, the mm. tax bill was 50 or 60, and yet if they fl- file for the long term, they make 100,000 or, or less, then they can get 
a significant reduction. In other words, it's the equivalent of a, a homeowner in the city of Chicago who uh, purchased the home before it inflated in value, uh, and they had a job. And now, you, so you're telling me these are re- legitimate uh, retirees in the North Shore suburbs who are living on a fixed income, purchased their home 20 years ago. Maybe it wasn't selling for six million when they purchased it. Maybe it was selling for one million, and uh, they could afford it then. Now, obviously, they couldn't afford it, if, but they're still living the home. Is that what you're saying? Well, let me just say this: when you buy a home of that value mm-hmm. even if it was 20 years ago you're going to be paying two or three million even yeah. back then yeah. and these are people who are in the finance industry and they own corporations and uh they're doing quite well but they don't have to draw off of their in their 401k they don't have to draw off of anything but if they kept their market if they kept their income at a hundred thousand or less they could cut their tax bill in half. Are you saying, uh, so we, to get uh, the long-term exemption, do you have to provide proof of what your uh, income is? Yes, you take the, the front page of the exemption, you fill it out, you flip it over, you write the amount of money that you made, and you do the Social Security benefits and everything else, and you sign it, and you get it notarized, and you send it to the assessor. They don't even require that you send the, the, your actual federal returns in. So it's an honor system. It's an honor system. But if they are suspicious, they will make you come to the assessor's office to check it. I have not seen them audit that. I see. There's a bus like that in New York. Follow me on this. There's a bus that takes you from the airport to uh, New York City proper, Manhattan. And they don't collect money from you. Uh, It's an honor system. You're supposed to buy a ticket. And the, the threat is that you never know when uh, some kind of bus monitor will come on and ask to see a ticket. And if you cannot show the bus monitor your ticket, that person, no, it writes you a, a, like a, a citation for a $50 fine or something. So it's either like you pay the 250 to go into Manhattan or you risk the $50 fine. So you're telling me essentially it's a similar thing uh, with long-term exemptions. And senior citizen freeze. A senior citizen freeze, you have to be 65 years old and you have to make 65,000 or less. And so again, you could be very wealthy. You're not drawn for your you know, your IRA, you're not drawn from any special pensions, private pension, but you're just collecting 65,000 and you can file for a senior freeze and you own a $5 million home and your tax bill gets cut from 60,000 to 30,000. So, you can you apply for the senior freeze exemption? and the long-term exemption? Yes, you can. And there you go, bingo, four exemptions. Your homeowner's exemption, your senior standard exemption, your senior freeze exemption, and yes, your long-term exemption. (laughs) And if you have a disability, you get your disability exemption. Well, you know, I always like to say, uh, the only advantage I can think about getting old, I've said this to you many times, is that you get to go to movie theaters and pay less for the the geezer uh, exemption at a movie theater. Uh, Now, the senior freeze 65 uh, exemption. So if you're over the age of 65 and your income is uh, 65,000, did you say? So remember, 65, 65 is turn, you turn 65, you make 65,000, you get that senior and that's freeze. an honor system as well uh yes you 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 just put your birth date down you have to give them your driver's license yes right. you do have to show that and so that they can verify that but the problem with these nine exemptions is they're very unwieldy the assessor's office does not have the manpower to implement them well or monitor them well and they've grown you know nine is a lot it's a record number for a state like uh, you know but if they're monitored well, you know, and they work properly, they're good exemption relief and property tax burden relief because we we have nothing out there other than the sky's the limit with ever increasing property taxes. So my my recommendation to the task force and and to the assessor's office is to advocate for if the long term exemption comes back you cap it at $850,000 home or a million dollar home. And with the senior citizen freeze, you rewrite the statute to say that it should be on a home that's of modest, you know, five hundred dollars or $600,000 home, whatever they come up with. Because what these exemptions were created for was to help the poorest of the poor, the middle income blue collar guy, make uh, the ability to 
have a property tax bill that he can pay and to give him that relief, but to give it to multimillionaires and people who have these multimillion dollar homes, that's wrong. That's not studying that exemption well and thinking like, just like you said, when people get their property taxes cut, it's like a balloon. You squeeze it and it goes out. To or the I would, what about this idea? Require people who are uh, seeking these exemptions to submit their tax returns. Because that would, what you're suggesting, you haven't actually said it, but what you're suggesting is that there are people who uh, don't deserve these exemptions in that they're not hard pressed to pay their tax bill because they have money. They can actually afford to live in these houses who are taking advantage of this because it's an honor system, because they're riding the bus from uh, Kennedy Airport or LaGuardia Airport to New York knowing that no monitor is gonna show up and possibly give them a citation, or they're willing to risk the $50 citation. When you look at the exemption, you don't look at how big the house is, what the value of the house is. There was a 40-year-old taxpayer that lived in Winneka. He was a equity uh, financier, and he happened to make $90,000 that year. Mm -hmm. The prior year, he made 300,000. After that, he made 400,000. But that year, he made 90,000. He filled out the form, and his property tax bill dropped from seventy-five thousand to forty-seven thousand. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so we've got to look at those exemptions. And say, are these the people that need that kind of break? Especially those that can afford, even if they bought the home twenty years ago, and they're, you know, they they run companies and they're, you know, in the financial industry and they're lawyers or so forth, doctors. I don't know that they need that kind of help. So we need to relook at what our senior freeze exemption, which is very good uh, if you qualify. You know, they came up with the idea of thinking that, well, if you make $65,000, you are probably going to make $65,000 for a long time. Mm -hmm. your, your, your income is not going to swing wide like that. Um, so when we looked at the long-term exemptions, it was only – applied to the northern regions and why it wasn't applied to the south suburbans i'm not sure but they said that they don't send out the long term anymore because it's sunsetting so my plumber was over one day and i said you know what you should try the long-term exemption it might help you and he goes well i never heard of it and i said well, fill this form out you got to make a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> or less yeah. and, and and send it in well he lives in morton grove and his property taxes he got his $900 homeowner's exemption off, and it was $900 because the tax rate's high. But then he got $2,000 <laughs> off for the long term. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, uh, he's like my dear friend Pat, the plumber at the bowling alley. He's making a lot more than $100,000, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, these are pretty some outrageous exemptions. Now, uh, when you made your suggestions at the governor's task force, what was the reaction? Because my bet is this is the third rail. You know, people, again, people, property taxes are so high. Uh, people are outraged. Lori Lightfoot is really under pressure not to raise them. Tony Preckwinkle just announced she wasn't going to raise them. Uh, I think we should, my personal belief, as I started by saying, is we should divorce ourselves from the property tax to fund schools. That doesn't seem to be very realistic, as you quickly point out. So what was the reaction uh, when, when you came up with these ideas about uh, reforming this uh, exemption system well i think a lot of jaws dropped because <laughs> there were three representatives yeah. you know the task force is made up of all of the legislators the representatives and then they're broken down in subcommittees mm -hmm. and six people on there three of them were representing the south side and so they were pretty hopping mad because what they saw was 6.7 million given to only 1126 people in the winneka area and then another 6.7 million in long-term and senior freezes given out to people that were in the wealthiest areas as well. Mm. That's not transparency and that's not reform and that's not, that's, you know, that's what makes people suspicious of the property tax system and of the, you know, everything that goes with it. So I think they're open to this. Now, we did also provide them with a study of the South suburbs and how there are pockets of areas that are foreclosures at 25%, sometimes even higher, where there's clusters of these foreclosures in Country Club Hills or Poison or um, Riverside, Riverdale, uh, Calumet City. 
and Dalton. And I, what we said was the best thing that came out of the legislature for property tax reform for the areas that are really hurting was in 2010, they said that you could reduce assessments based on these terribly high mm-hmm. foreclosures, that that adversely affect that neighborhood. And you could utilize that and say those values should come down. They never once implemented that. I, you know, it's like the underwater uh, floodplain of the mortgages and a and lot of auctions in that area. But I do believe that study has been given to Kagi. I think that they will consider that for the south suburbs and apply those type of what they call the hedonic effect. You know, if you've got floodplains, mm-hmm. um, you get the hedonic effect, meaning you don't look at any of the sales. The sales are not important. The most powerful thing is the fact that there's these floodplains that are causing 20%, as they think, devaluations of their property. Well, the hedonic effect of foreclosures is grave, and mm-hmm. it needs to be taken into consideration to give those South Suburban folks um, fair tax mm-hmm. bills, considering that their tax rate are 300% higher than our, ours. Or their highest tax rate out there is 34. Chicagoans, 6.9. Mm. What's the 6.9? Our tax rate in the city of Chicago yeah. is 6.9. Out in the su- suburbs, on the average, the tax rate is 15. Yeah, and the reason for that is that, uh, again, your tax bill is basically the tax rate times the value of the property. The lower the overall value of property is in a town, the higher they have to make the rate uh, to uh, pay their bills, pay their schools. Again, this funds the schools. And so it, when you look at that rate, the higher the rate, it sort of senses that the area could be in trouble because it's depending on a property market that's not really strong. It's not Uh, sustainable. It's absolutely not sustainable. Absolutely. That's the basic point. It's not sustainable. I couldn't set it better myself. Uh, Andrea Rayla, if uh, folks want to get in touch with you, want to learn more about this, how can they do so? Well, they can look look us up at uh, taxestohigh.com. But uh, we also work with a group called TRAIN. It's um, Training, Research, Education, and Advocacy Network. And um, that is um, uh, a nonprofit group that does this research and, and gives it out to the legislators and also has been very active in advocating for property tax legislation reform. All right, very good. Andrea Rella, thanks so much for coming in. Pat Quinn, former governor, was uh, in in the 2 o'clock hour, and Miles uh, Camp Lassen from In These Times uh, was here uh, earlier as well. Uh, Dennis and I are going to be heading, uh, hopping in the car, going over to Sidetrack for tonight's uh, town hall. Join us, won't you? Yes, indeed. Uh, Sidetrack over. It's in, it's in Boys Town, and uh, it's on Halstead and Boys Town. Sidetrack, look it up, Google it, join us. Marion Williamson will be there. Marion Williamson will be there. She'll be, I don't know when she's dropping in, but she did. Yes, that's presidential candidate Marion Williamson will be there as wow. well. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. And uh, so anyway, uh, Dr. D, I wanted to say you did a great job as always. Give yourself a raise. Take it out of petty cash. Don't pay property taxes on it. See you tomorrow, everybody. And remember, you can download previous Ben Jarofsky shows and Benny J bonus interviews at both Chicago Sun-Times and Chicago Reader websites and wherever else you download your favorite podcasts. Downloaders, you know we live stream this program, right? It's true. We live stream. Tuesdays through Fridays, 1 until 3 p.m. Central Time at both Chicago Sun-Times and Chicago Reader websites, the Chicago Sun-Times YouTube channel, and on Facebook. Just search for at Benny J Show. And if you've yet to like the page, well, you should. Because once we hit 2,100 likes, we will have our next caption contest. Right now we're at 2,083. 17 more to go. Send them your our way. Once we do, we'll have a caption contest. We'll see you tomorrow. That's correct.